no trouble with my voice. And so my apologies. I have a microphone here just to try to help my voice, and I'll just try to save my voice. Sana, uh, Sana, we can finish this whole four hours. But welcome, welcome, and thank you for coming, and thank you for your time. So we will continue today. Let's ask the Lord for his help as we, as we think through these things together. So Father, thank you this morning that you are God, that you were already preparing this morning for us before any of us were awake. You had already prepared this day for us before any of us were born. Back then, no, no. We thank you that today, what we are doing is part of your plan. There is no accident. Everything is in your hands. Everything is under your control. We thank you today that we see this wisdom and we see your control and your sovereignty. Even in scripture, that we see in your words, you had already planned and created all of the details of your word. Before there was anything, before there was anything, you knew it all. And so we thank you that in that, then, as we begin this class, as we begin this time together as sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can fellowship together around your word. And we thank you also that we can be sure this is itself a part of your plan. You called us and you commanded us to spend time together around this book, studying this book, loving this book, learning about this book. So you gave us this calling. And we just want to be faithful to all of the things that you gave us to do. Coming from Sana, I we cannot do this today without your help, so we beg your help today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, so, let me just make one adjustment here. Uh, yes. Great. And then, um, can we do this before we even get started? Let's review a little bit and what were some of the things that we talked about last time. The bottom of the main ideas in chapter one. And what was the, the kind of the concept that we were trying to argue in chapter one? Anyone? Uh, why don't we? I think we'll start over here with Brother Manny. We'll go across. All right. And if you just give me one concept from chapter one, excuse one concept from chapter one that really helped you stood out. Uh, Influential studies, you know, are kind of annoying. Let's just go across, starting with Brother Manny and each person sharing one concept, I don't know, from last lecture or from last chapter. Okay, well, uh, specifically, uh, specifically, animal. Beyond. Okay, great. Do you remember the, I gave actually three different purposes for Revelation. And the three different purposes were one, to save, two, to judge, three, to glorify God. Um, so actually think for a second about these. It's pretty interesting. I didn't do this last time. But these three are, in many ways, these three are linked. What I mean by that, I'll put it this way. There's a connection or a relationship to that. So salvation, excuse me, revelation has a purpose. What is the purpose? Or what are the purposes? Uh, anyway, forgive the word order. I don't know what's going on. But I will say it's to save, to judge, and to glorify God, right? Okay, if those are the three purposes, you could think save and judge are opposite, and they kind of are. In a way, 
if you are saved, you will not be judged. And in another, another way, if you are judged, you will not be saved. So in a way, they're opposites. In another way, these two go together. And here's what I mean. Every person must be judged for their sin. Every person must be judged for their sin. Everyone must be judged for their sin. Okay? So why will I not be in hell forever? And the answer is because Jesus took my judgment. Jesus was judged for the sin that I did. Judgment. So actually what I discover is that these two are united by the cross because in the cross I see salvation and I see judgment. Jesus is judged so that I won't have to be. And once I do that, then I realize actually all three of these purposes go together. Because where do you more clearly see the glory of God than the cross? So actually I discover all three of these purposes are they're quite connected. They're quite, uh, yeah, they're quite perfectly brought together in the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to save. Jesus came to receive my judgment so that God will be glorified. Okay. And those three purposes stand together. So, Brother Manny, thank you. Very impressive. Oh, you have any information? Thank you. Okay, uh, next, what would we say? Any. Oh, kai anong uh, anong insight or galing chapter one po? Uh, any impression na uh, ito po or na ay ito po or kai ano? And actually, for you on the chat as well, we need a man. You can or also you guys can share something as well. Yes, sir. Only the unrich can say and blame anyone that they did not understand about this thing. When we see the universe of creation, it is us to accept or reject. Excellent, good. Uh, so he was mentioning about universal revelation, something I did not talk about last time, uh, but I can do it now. That is relating to that. If you go to Romans uh, 1, and I'll put that on the screen here. Uh, so make sure I get the right one. I think, uh, too many different documents at the same time. Come on, you know what? Okay, so Romans 1. So, um, so uh, Romans chapter 1, if you go to that passage, you find that general revelation, universal revelation, is part of God's holding the world accountable. So let's just show, I'll just show you what I mean. Uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How so or why? Because, listen to this verse 9, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. God hath showed it unto them. What? The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see the logic of it? What you can know about God, they know that. Alam nila, kahit unreached, ang kategory nila. Even if they're unreached, they still can know that there is a God in heaven. nila. <coughs> and because of that, the conclusion is here. They are without excuse. So actually, even kahit unreached talaga, even a person who was completely unreached comes to heaven and says, but God, you can't condemn me because I never got a chance. I 
never heard the truth. And God's answer to that person would be, actually, you lived in my revelation. You lived in my revelation. So you did see it, and you didn't know it. I don't know. Okay, now, did you accept that or not? And I said, like, no, I did not. No, I did not. Because look at this. Because when they knew God, even when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but they became empty in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened. And uh, I'm actually going to skip ahead here a little bit. Um, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Uh, all the way down to the conclusion of this, they know the judgment of God. They know the judgment. They not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them. Do. And actually, I skipped. I should go all the way up here. Um, here, right here, this language. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I'm going to look at one other translation. Let's do this. Let's see what this looks like. In a, in a uh, modern translation, they're going to express this. Who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. Suppress. Suppress means uh, they know the information. They know what is true. They know what God has spoken. But they reject it because they do not want to hear what he has said. Suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. So when you put all of that together, it's a, a rather dark view of humanity, and in some way made a depressing chapter. But in another way, you recognize right? that is the way I was. And, um, you recognize that no one can reach heaven and say, Lord, you never gave me a chance. God's answer was I gave you a world, and I filled that world with the truth. You did not listen. You know? Okay. Great. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mom Vanessa. Great. Great. God has spoken. And revealing himself is something, what do you say? Um, Maybe what I'll do or what I'll say is revealing himself is something inherent in his nature. Why does God reveal himself? Answer, because he's like that. Get in shape. I mean, that's really it. Because he's like that. So God wants to reveal himself. It's part of his nature. It's part of what he wants to do. It's part of the universe. And I think that becomes really a beautiful thing once I understand then um, so when I read scripture, I'm seeing in scripture, this is God's desire. God wants to reveal himself to me. Okay, let's come across. What other things do you have to What other things do you have to We are now. Great, good. Okay, um, some of the ideas you gave it there. Very helpful, I guess, to say um, it's not just God's giving his word that is the beginning of revelation, but actually the Sumerapala with even the way he made people. So he made my nature so that I am prepared for revelation. Okay. And so if you if you ask things like why do we have the ability to talk? 
Why do we have the ability to think? Why do we have the ability to read? If Koman believe or not, ganun lang ni. Right? Ganun lang. Ganun lang ba? Like this just sort of popped out of a rock somewhere. And we have the ability to talk. I don't think so. And so the biblical or the more theological explanation is you talk, think, read, have ideas, even your relational, because God planned to reveal himself and have a relationship with you. Or it's a kind of purpose, okay? connected in a kind of purpose for revelation. All right. Excellent, excellent. That's one of the biggest things I think in Hong uh, Wei Day, where just everyone gave one insight or one part of reflection from last week. I'm going to review Lang Pong. So, if you can, no, um, uh, if you can uh, what, think of one thing that came for you last week. Okay, so, uh oh, if I was going to pick one thing from last week, that's what I would say. Uh, but all of the things you've given are excellent. Okay. And Christ is the climactic revelation. That's why we have this kind of language. He is the word. Right? It's very important language. Um, he is the revelation of God. Christ speaks for God. No one has seen God at any time. Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, has declared him, has explained him. So very important. And then we discussed, we spent some time. Uh, is scripture the climax or is Christ the climax? And our conclusion there was, it's not really a good distinction to ask which is the most important or something like that. But in another way, you could say, oh, Jesus is the climactic revelation. And I'm seeing that as I look down the chat, um, I'm Joyce, Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation. So that's good. Um, I'm sorry for the, for the mic, if you give me about 20 or 30 minutes, I can, I'll switch my microphone so that hopefully it sounds better uh, because so it won't be so reverberant. Is it okay? I mean, can you understand mostly the idea? If you give me a little uh, feedback, go ahead. So I'll try to get it better quality in a little bit. Sorry about that. Good, okay, one more. Uh, what would you say is your uh, is upon is upon reflection from last week. Great. God wants us to know him. Great. And we discussed that a little bit. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. Good. Okay. So here's my plan for today. Uh, what we did, Tamanaman, what we did talk about last week were these four topics. And I'm, uh, give me a, a second out of this up for you to see. But we started out with foundations, connecting revelation to apologetics and theology proper. Um, we talked about biblical theology, Christology, anthropology, ecclesiology. All we were doing, if you remember, let's see how quickly I can read this chart. If you remember this chart, we were connecting each one of these um, ideas to a framework. I want to shape. Here we go. We were connecting each one of the doctrine of revelation to a framework: apologetics, doctrine of God, story of the Bible, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of man, doctrine of the church. So we were just drawing a line between each part of the doctrine of revelation and these kind of divisions of theology. So that was our concept last week. Um, and after we worked through all of that information, we spent one hour talking about the fate of the unevangelized. And so our conclusion there was to realize uh, there are some struggles here. It's a difficult thing to explain. But at the end of the discussion, I do have to say, salvation comes only through Jesus. Salvation comes only through Jesus. And so a person who dies without knowing Jesus, the Messiah, cannot be saved. Okay, but we put together with that, we, we don't know, would, would maybe God make a way for someone to know? I don't know. Uh, I can't say. So I don't know on a lot of these things. So that's where we ended up with our conclusion. 
And then we talked about the introduction to universal and redemptive revelation. So, uh, it's a full request. The last three tables about uh, my, my, my kind of problem. I think they're having full problems with this. So, they look at the four dot row. Okay, let's do this then. Let's go to Psalm 19. And we already we already looked at Psalm 19 last week. Uh, let me change this a bit easier to do here. So, uh, we looked at Psalm 19 last week. I just want to get it back into our heads and make sure that it's clear uh, so that we have these things clearly in our heads. Okay, so while I'm pulling that up, we're going to read through the psalm. But then I want you to tell me where is the transition verse? Where is the verse? Because this is the way the song works. The first half of the song is all about general revelation or universal revelation. The second half of the song is all about redemptive revelation. Where is the break? Okay, so Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and from him show his handiwork day unto day under his speech, night unto night show of knowledge. There is no speech nor language where there is voices not heard. Everywhere you go, this truth is known. Their mind is gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world, in them have he set a tabernacle for the sun. And that sun goes forth from one end of heaven to the other. The circuits go to the end of it. There's nothing hid from the heat of the sun. And then, to me, anyway, the transition after that is shocking. Because it's something, what we're talking about. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart of the man of the Lord is pure. Lightening the eyes and fear of the Lord is clean. And forever the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous and altogether. Or to be, de are to be desired are they in gold, yet in much fight gold. So we are also the honey and the holding honey. Okay, and the conclusion of the psalm let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, Master. So, where would we divide the psalm? Where, Brother Manny, where does it shift from general revelation to redemption? Verse 7. Verse 7 is the transition. And therefore, if, I, if I'm reading this psalm, or even if I'm just trying to understand generally, what is the concept of general revelation, special revelation? I, I think this is the point that I want you to, to get from this, to realize it's not just a thing I made up. It's not just my view. This is quite clearly and quite simply in the passage itself. It's right here, right? So in Psalm 19, I can find this. It's very clear that it's here. Okay, any questions there? Um, because where we're going to go now with this is to start thinking through how this looks, looks for each one of the details of the different types of revelation. So we're going to talk through some of the expressions of general revelation, some of the expressions of uh, the, the redemptive revelation. So we'll just start talking through those pieces together. Let me show you then a couple of insights that I want you to remember for each one of these. Uh, excuse me. So a couple of insights that you would want to know on each one of these points as you understand what is the significance of general revelation and the special revelation. Uh, first foundation, creation, and you have this in your book. Uh, this is page, give me a second. This is page 104. So the first division here is creation. And a point I just want to make here as far as why is creation a universal revelation? I'd seen no time. Any word, any, any person, anywhere can know this revelation. Well, what can they know? Two things, ideas that are big with this. One, 
there must be a God who started all of this. And he must be really big and really powerful. There has to be a God who started all of this. So the logic of this goes, the world could not have just made itself. There has to be a God who began all of this. And if that God began all of this, siyempre naman, ay lang mas malaki kaysa sa akin. Right? I mean, God can't just be like me and create a world. So there must be a God and he must be bigger than us. Second concept under this creation idea. It's not just hindi lang malakas siya, hindi lang malakas siya, it's not just that God is from the beginning and that he's really powerful, but here's a related idea. God is good. God is gracious. And you see this in places like this. Um, God made the world. He saw it, and behold, it was very good. Okay. All these things came by his hand. But you, you also see, and I should have this reference in here, uh, Paul speaking to the uh, it's a group of farmers in Acts, and I'll pull the reference later, Acts 17, I think. Uh, and he's speaking to them, and he says to them, you saw the goodness of God when he gave you rain, and he gave you good fruits, and he gave you a good nature to live in. So the argument of this goes, the sun came up this morning, and I was walking up the hill, and the sun was shining, I thought, it's good to be alive. And then I thought, God made that sun rise this morning. God gave the sunrise. Right? God gave us the rain last night. The next time you eat a fruit, you know, the next time you eat a mango, you just realize God made that and gave it its delicious taste. And he could have made all food taste like sand. Right? All food, you know, we could have just every day we eat sand. That's just what we do. It's really boring. We dread it. We don't like it at all. But it, you know, if you don't, you'll die. So I love it, I love it, I love it. He could have made food like that. He didn't. He made life beautiful. And so every time you enjoy something about the beauty of life on planet Earth, you know, just a lot, just a lot. And I think that, that all of that is built in to tell you God is powerful, he's big, he's great, he's also good. In fact, it's interesting. If we did our last semester, what is God's nature? I had two categories for his attributes. God is great, God is good. Okay, if I think about this general revelation, both of those categories are right here. God is great, God is good. Those are the two big categories right here in this section. I think that's pretty fascinating. Okay, um, second category that we have here was providential care. And providential care, okay, here's where I have the references and uh, now I see that. Um, providential care is going to be a little bit different from creation. Not just that God created a world, but that he takes care of the world. God takes care of the world and he maintains the world. He didn't just make it. Okay, so um, here, look at a couple of the passages that we have in here. Matthew 5, 45. The rain falls both on those who hate God and those who love him. Or Acts 14, that was the reference I was trying to find. He did not leave himself without witness. He did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Or Luke, the, the argument of Luke, this is Jesus speaking. God takes care of flowers. God takes care of birds. Who feeds the birds every morning? See, I can't afford, this is the thing, I can't afford to feed the birds, not all the birds. How many tons, how many thousands of tons, probably millions, I don't know, how many millions or at least hundreds of thousands of tons of biomass is consumed by a bird, by the birds of the popu bird population of the world every day. Every day, hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of tons of biomass to keep all the birds alive. No country 
could afford a budget all of that. Not in a country. Okay, God does. God feeds the birds every day. And so the argument of this goes, it's not just that he made the world, he's taking care of, taking care of it all the time. I won't do anything more to this, but I did add a reference, you can see I just wrote in here. But it's very interesting, Psalm 104 is a passage worth thinking about with this. Psalm 104 has lots of creation language in it. So when you read Psalm 104, it sounds like a repeat of Genesis 1. But what's so interesting about Psalm 104, it is repeating Genesis 1, except this time, it repeats Genesis 1 with a focus on God takes care of the world. So it talks about trees and birds and beasts and man and even angels. It talks about all the parts of creation. But when it talks about all the parts of creation, the idea is God takes care of those parts. Not just that he made them, but he takes care of them. Okay, under humanity. <coughs> I have four points that would stand out to me thinking with humanity uh, that are significant. And if our concept with all of these is in general revelation, God shows his nature, and nature again. Okay. Then think about this. Where would you find that more clearly than in the image of God? You see the logic of that. In other words, I can look at the world, I can look at mountains, trees, worms, fish. I can say, wow, God is really big, God is really smart, God is really powerful. He made this worm. Look at it go. Okay. But how much more when I look at the one creature on planet Earth, is that on? the one creature on planet Earth that is made in God's image. And when you look at the one made in God's image, when you look at humanity, you will see the glory of God in an even greater way. Because the humans are made in his image. The worms and butterflies are not. The humans are. And uh, I've talked, or I will talk about in a future class, what is the image of God. So what am I on discussion deep outside? Also, uh, what I do say here are four points about humanity that are part of the way we are showing the glory of God. We have an unquenchable longing to study and understand. I think that's really interesting. Why do human beings want to explore space? It's not just so that we can bring back better food or something. In other words, the point is, so a lot of our exploration for our study it's not just to fulfill like biological needs or technology or something like that. There is something in humans that we just want to know. Okay. And there are some things we study just because we're really curious. We're just really curious. Human beings like to study God's world. I think this is an expression of the image of God in us because of this kind of connection. God made the world, and then he said it was good. You are made in the image of God. So when you study the world, something inside of your heart goes, that's good. That's good. God said it was good. There's something in you that knows that this is true. And I think that's an expression of the image. So when you stand up on a mountain and you look out and you see the sunset, Amganda, what you're saying in that, you're saying, yes, what God said is true. The world he made is good. It is good. And when you study science and you study how this worm moves or something, and you're amazed, Amgalina man, what you're saying is, Right? And it's because in your heart, even kai unbeliever, even if you're an unbeliever, you know in your heart there is a God because you're made in his image. All right, number two, human beings naturally want to create, build, and improve upon the world around them. 
Um, and the idea here, but we're made in the image of God. What is the meaning of the image of God? There's something about you that's similar to God. Of course, different. But in other ways, it's similar. There is something that God has made about you that mirrors or echoes the nature of God. That's true. Okay. Well, here's the miracle of this then. God is a creating God. He likes to create. He created this world. You, human, me, human, we like to create as well. Okay, what's the feeling if you work on a project? You know, uh, Brother Manny, he basically built this building with his two hands. The whole building had shut up. Okay, when you work on a project and then you get done, you finish the project, <sighs> and you enjoy it because you know you work hard and you know that the result is nice, you say, wow, okay, why? What's happening in your heart? What's happening in your heart is echoing or mirroring the nature of God himself. God created a world. When he finished, he said, it is good, and he rested. And when you work, and you work hard, and you do a good job, and you get done, you find delight, you enjoy the thing that you made, and you rest. <laughs> and that's part of the image of God. Well, the, the way that, well, I'll keep on building, but that itself is telling you something about God. Aesthetics, enjoyment of art and music. Um, human beings do things with music and art that, that have no direct biological benefit. In other words, if you're evolutionist, then you'll say, everything the creatures do is for the survival of their species. And so basically, this is the really dark side of evolution. Everything you do behaviorally, the things they do are just to, in order to pass their genes to the next generation. That's it. We want to survive, we want to pass our genes generation. And that defines all activity. Okay. But look at the humans. Is that really true? And the answer is you find the humans doing all kinds of things for beauty, art, music, that have no direct biological benefit. They just do it for enjoyment. Why would the humans be like that? And the answer is because we're made for more than just passing our genes to the next generation. Evolution is not a sufficient answer to explain the world. We're made for more. What are we made for? We're made to praise. We're made to love, to love God. We're made to worship. And these kinds of categories of beauty, rich beauty, are an expression of what we will do forever. What will you do in eternity? You will work. You will create. You will do things. And if you want to think of it like working, even the way that you work today, without the frustration, working without the sweat, working without the brokenness, working without the bad stuff, you will work for the glory of God. One of the ways you will do that is in the beauty of praising Him, worshiping Him. Right? And that's related, I think, to our enjoyment of our music. And then finally, uh, marriage, and my argument with marriage would go, and we did this last semester with apologetics a little bit, but my argument with marriage would go, uh, God, okay, God gives general revelation. Anywhere you go, you can see God is great, he's powerful. You can see things about him, even in the nature of humans. Okay, what about this? In order to demonstrate his love, he creates, he creates the humans. So that they will also love each other. And so you have this pattern that happens over and over and over again. It's worldwide, it's transcultural, okay? And cultures and all the way back into ancient times have had something like this. Man and woman, just them, two people and only them committed to each other for life. It's a very, it's, it's a natural thing that is built into our natures. Why do we like that? Why do we want that? 
And the answer is because God wanted to create in the humans an illustration of his love. And when I get further up to Ephesians 5, Paul's explanation is this is a great mystery. This is about Christ and the church. So when you see humans expressing love, even I'll go past this, I'll say, if you go into the store and you go to your phone, you walk in, and they have music playing. Right now, it's the guru about some Christmas. But generally, you listen to the songs they're playing, they're all love songs. Human beings think about love all the time. It's a big deal for us. Really big deal. If we have love songs playing all over and over again, This really kind of annoying song. So, you know, last year, blah, 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 I gave you my heart, but the next year you gave it away or something. Like, we're connecting. It's Christmas, but we still have to make it a love song. Really? I mean, why? Because we care about this a lot. And I think what that's telling us is God built the desire for love into us. And we naturally think that way. And why? So that he can show something about himself. He loves you. He loves you the way nobody else does. He loves you more than your parents, your spouse, your children, and everything. God loves God is the essence of the expression of love. Okay, so when we put that together, then you can know quite about quite a lot about God. You can know quite a lot about his nature just from what we call general revelation, just from the world, just from the things around us. Okay. Um, I'll pause there. Any questions? Uh, Stay for the chat. If anyone has a question on the chat. Any questions about some of these specifics with the general revelation? Okay. Um, a couple of ideas to finish up with that is just to recognize this last part. Uh, okay, we can know a lot about general revelation from the world, but the truth is so many people reject God. Okay. So now the question I'm asking, if we can know so much about him, and we can, that's true. If we can know so much about God and we can, why do people still reject? And the ultimate answer to that question is what we saw earlier in Romans 1.18. People do know the truth. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Here's where we have to fix our thinking when it comes to the, quote, unevangelized or the unreached. Our mind goes, okay, so they are going to be condemned because of something they did not know. That's our temptation, right? Okay, God will send them to hell because they did not know something. Wrong. They knew. God will send them to hell because they rejected. That's the biblical argument. It's not because they did not know. Alam nila. But they rejected what God told them about themselves. Okay? So the logic of that then is our, it is our nature. We do not seek after our God. We turn away. Okay. Um, when you put that together, then with this next, and this is the point that we talked about also earlier, universal revelation is not sufficient for salvation. And I, I think it would maybe, that it would be worth taking a second uh, to look at this passage. I'll go to Romans 10, 13 to 14, just to make sure that we still have this clearly in our heads. Uh, Romans 10, 13 to 14, the logic of this, this would be the clearest, but there are other passages. Uh, the logic of this passage goes, oops, give me a second. Uh, the logic of this passage goes, how can they call on a God that they have not heard or that they have not known? Well, how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without the preacher? And if you follow that logic out, the argument of it goes, they cannot call on Jesus as their savior if they do not know him. And that means they have to hear about him. 
or they have to hear the gospel in order to be saved. Right? So that foundation, you, you want to have that in your mind, even though it's a struggle. And that was why we talked about the fate of the unevangelized. But even though it's a struggle, you still want to have that passage in your mind. Right? How that works, if, you know, if we discussed last week, if there would be any possibility that somebody call on God and God would give them a revelation. I don't know. I can't say yes. I can't say no. So we discussed that in some depth last week. Okay, uh, but that took us out of the general revelation section, and that was the last idea. What we need to set us free is the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, the redemptive revelation. Um, and so I'm going to move down into redemptive revelation. If you have questions, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll keep on moving. If you have a question, you can just interrupt me. So we talked about dreams and visions. Um, all I would want you to catch from that or remember with that is that just because you have a dream, it doesn't mean you know what it means. And we have a couple of passages in Daniel where uh, they received the dream, but they have no interpretation. Daniel chapter 2 happens again in Daniel chapter, it's not in, well, Daniel chapter 4. He received a dream, but there's no interpretation. Right? Even later... Daniel receives visions from God in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. And then he says, I did not understand. So just because you receive a dream or a revelation, uh, even if you receive like a vision from God, you would not know how to interpret it. And here is where we ought to be really concerned about uh, certain parts of groups and movements, charismatic movements, that will treat dreams and revelations as though they're the best revelations. Right? So the irony becomes the way they talk about it. Here's the Bible. Yeah, but that's kind of boring. I received a dream. And it's like the dream or the vision. If you say, I received a vision from an angel. Wow, I want to hear about that. Okay. Where actually, if you look at scripture, you realize dreams and revelations from God, even if they were happening today, I don't believe they are. But even if they were happening today, you don't have any interpretation of that. Where scripture, God has given you a complete book that leads you how to interpret it. He gives you a book and he explains what it means, right? So scripture is going to be the superior, superior revelation here. What would you do if you received, uh, you know, a special dream or something? One of my children said to me the other day, Daddy, I received a dream and uh, it was really scary. I think Satan gave me dream okay um what if you received a, that was cute. But what if you received a dream or something some kind of revelation what would you do if god suddenly told you if you you excuse me in your dream you dream that god suddenly told you this new thing like what would you do and the answer is that's really that's actually a really easy thing to answer galatians even if we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel than the gospel you have received let him be accursed, right? In other words, the book that you hold defines Christianity. This defines Christianity. And so whatever other thing might come, this book is the standard. This book is the standard of Christianity. Galatians 1, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. This book defines Christianity. Uh, one other piece that's interesting with this, two different passages, Colossians 2.18, Jude 1.8, talk to us, false teachers rely on dreams and visions. So if you want to know what is a false teacher, one of the marks of a false teacher, madala uh, siyang depend, and actually, dito sa notes pala, madala siyang dumadepende sa dreams and visions. A false teacher will constantly, well, I received this dream, I received this vision. Right? Why? Because they can't demonstrate their teaching from Scripture. And so since they can't prove their teaching from Scripture, they have to rely on other things. Okay? They have to rely on things that only they can talk about. I received the vision. No one else was there. No one else knows. Only I received this vision. Special afrikase. Right? And they have to do this kind of thing because they're twisting scripture. 
So if they were actually accountable to scripture, scripture would correct them. And therefore, what do they do? They depend on dreams and visions to escape the authority of scripture. Well, so once you do that, that really helps us process what's going on in some parts of charismaticism, where they, instead of talking about scripture, they want to talk about their dream or their vision. That's not a good sign. That's not promising, right? That's not, it, it, there's no way that will go well. Okay, um, the unusual means here is, I talked about that briefly last week, but one thing I did not talk about last week, which is interesting, um, one expression of revelation would be the results of a miracle. So the unusual means would be things like, you know, the voice of a donkey, God writing on a plaster wall, all kinds of storms, earthquakes, things like that. But here, how about this? Have you ever thought about this? Naaman is a leper, and then God heals him. Okay? From that time, everywhere Naaman goes, Shaif, see Naaman, you that thing leper. Right? I mean, he's going to be known as the former leper. Lazarus was dead. Everywhere he goes, he will be known as the guy who used to be dead. Right? The man who was born blind, his whole life, he was blind. Now he can see. So he can walk around and he can say, John 9, I don't know. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. Okay. Well, actually, in a way, these things are revelation. Right? They are living proof of the power of God in this world. So I would put that under the category of living revelation. Things that uh, are unusual revelation. Things that can be destroyed. Uh, I will skip this except you to see it. Direct speech. The idea of this is times like when at Jesus' baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I love peace. So what kind of revelation is it? God just spoke it. He just said it. You heard a voice from heaven. Right? And so it's direct speech. God just said it straight from heaven. Um, and actually, there's a decent amount of this. Uh, it happens at Jesus' baptism. It happens at the transfiguration. Uh, it happens in Revelation, where a voice just speaks, and God just says it. Prophets, uh, again, we talked about this briefly, but the idea you want to know here for prophets, do not think of prophet as just a future predictor. And we make this mistake because we think prophet, prophecy, prophecy. So we hear prophecy, and the meaning of prophecy is future prediction. And therefore we think prophet, what is a prophet? He's a guy that predicts, predicts the future. Well, he does, but he does a lot more than that. Basically a prophet is a preacher, that's it. A prophet is a preacher. And if you notice this detail about the prophets, the prophets preach, also the prophets are primarily ministering in about the eighth to the sixth centuries. So you can notice a prophet, a pattern, with the prophets. And why does that matter? It's especially in that time, 8th to 6th century BC, excuse me. It's especially in that time when God is telling them, I'm going to judge you, the Babylonian captivity. So if you will not repent, you will be judged. If you will not repent, you will be judged. So it's that warning of judgment. Well, it's right in that period because that's right when the Babylonian captivity happened, 8th to 6th century BC. So the prophets are primarily coming there. But here's the very significant piece of this. Um, there is a set of passages that talk about the test of a true prophet. So if a prophet came and said, let's go worship idols, you know he's not a prophet, right? Okay, our equivalent of that in 2019, if a person comes around and says, I am a, I am a spokesperson for God, I am a preacher of the gospel, and next thing out of his mouth is some violation of the truth of scripture. I have found in scripture that homosexuality is not a sin. Then you say, okay, well, that's easy. You're not a preacher of the gospel. You're not a true preacher at all. Why? Because you, you contradicted what I know is God's word. Okay. So that's a, a really fascinating uh, concept that stands underneath with prophets. If you ever violate what God has clearly told you is true, you're not a prophet. 
if you're teaching against what God has told you is true, you're not a prophet. You're a false prophet, at least on that point. But, but yeah, in general, that destroys your credibility. And then one other point I want to put here, and I did not develop this in the notes, but it's, well, actually, I'll keep on going because it develops underneath angels. Okay, angels, this is a major pattern with angels as messengers. So I see angels speaking for God. The angel Gabriel brought revelation to Daniel uh, at least three different times. Zachariah received a bunch of revelations from angels. In the New Testament, an angel delivered the news to Zachariah that, the, that John the Baptist would be born and to Mary and Joseph that Jesus would be born, even the shepherds. So when you go to that passage in Luke and the angels are there, uh, I, wish I, could, I wish I could go to that passage. We could spend some time in Luke because it's beautiful. The angels are there. And they're crying out, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. And the angels are worshiping. The angels, it's not, the angels are sent by God. And, okay, okay, I have a message. <sighs> a baby will be born and you will find it in a manger. So glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men. Can we go now? Right? It's not that. The angels are actually there. And I think the framework we should use the angels are in awe. The angels, are, it's, like, it's like the angels, I, I don't know enough about angels, none of us do, to say it, this is the way it works. But I'll just put it in human terms. It's like the angel is there and he's going to make an announcement. And he says, this announcement is so beautiful. I'll have to try really hard not to start crying while I tell this announcement. Because it's so beautiful. And the, the sky just explodes with rejoicing. And it's not just the angels parang, ano, palabas or something. It's not just for them to get panuure for the humans. It's not just that. It's not just to put on a show for the humans. The angels are actually just worshipers. Angels are worshipers. So they carry the message and they worship. Uh, we also see in Hebrews 2, angels spoke having a part in delivering the message of the Old Testament. In some way... I would say here, angels and prophets are very similar. In the sense, what do angels do? They speak for God. What do prophets do? They speak for God. Okay. Which takes me into the next, Christophany. Christophany is a scary word, just meaning Christ. Revelation. Jesus is revelation. And so if you read the angel of the Lord passages, that gets us a little confused. Sometimes people have an idea that Jesus used to be an angel. Right? He used to be Datishang Angel Tapas Naging Dalasha. And very critical for you to know, Jesus has never been an angel. Jesus has only ever been God. And he took flesh and became man. Jesus has never been an angel. I know that from Hebrews 2. He took not on him the flesh of angels. Right? Okay. But why then do I have this pattern with Jesus referred to as the angel of the Lord? And I won't build this idea here because we'll do it under Christology, and I'll show you. I can show you a bunch of passages and prove to you the angel of the Lord has to refer to Jesus. Why? Here, I want what, and I hope maybe you'll write this down. When you hear angel of the Lord, the idea I'd like you to think is messenger of the Lord. That's what angel means. Angel just means messenger. So the angel of the Lord passages, they're actually messenger of the Lord passages, which fits our theme that we've already said, Jesus speaks for God. Jesus speaks for God. And therefore, when I do the angel of the Lord passages, I'm just seeing Jesus as a messenger speaking for God. That's all I'm talking about. In fact, when you put this together richly, you discover Jesus is the messenger. Jesus is the great one speaking for God. Do you remember this prophecy? Uh, we talked about prophets a little bit earlier. Remember, prophets are one form of revelation. Well, if you go back to Deuteronomy 18, Moses predicts that the Messiah in the future, there will, become, there will come one who will be greater than me, the prophet greater than Moses, the very famous prophecy. The prophet greater than Moses. What prophet could be greater than Moses? When you get to the Gospels in John, There's this pattern of them asking, do you think this is the prophet? Could this be the prophet, they ask? Okay, what they're asking. 
is this the Deuteronomy 18 prophet, the prophet greater than Moses? And so if, if I put those pieces together, what I get or what I realize is all prophets for all time are just building up until the end. And then at the end of time, if you think of it like here, here are the prophets. Okay. And so all of the prophets, they speak for God. They speak for God. They speak for God. They speak for God. They're all building up. Here are all the prophets. Okay. But all of that, all of these prophets, they're just pointers to the ultimate prophet. There's only one prophet like this, the prophet, and it's Jesus. And so Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel, anyone that else that spoke for God as a prophet, they're just a shadow of the prophet. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the ultimate prophet. How about angels? Well, what I discover is I'm going to write angels, but then I'm also going to put under that messengers. And what I discover here is all of the angels that spoke for God, and faithfully, they did what they were supposed to do. God sent them with a message. They did it. All of them, all of those angels, all of those messengers, all of them are just pointers to the messenger. And so Jesus is the climactic prophet. Jesus is the climactic messenger because Jesus is the climactic revelation. Jesus shows who God is. Jesus speaks for God. And let me show you that with a set of passages. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So how do you see the glory of God? Jesus. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him. Jesus declares God. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, in different ways and at different times, spake unto the fathers by the prophets. Excuse me, I've got to add this reference. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, Jesus speaks for God. Jesus is the climactic expression of the glory and of the revelation of God. Uh, Luke, excuse me, or John 12, 49, Jesus says, I have not spoken of myself. The Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say, what I should speak. Jesus speaks the message that God gave him. All things are delivered to me of my Father. No man knoweth who the Son is but the Father. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto me but by the Father. And no one comes to the Father but by me. Excuse me. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And that becomes very climactic in John 14, 10. Believe us not that I am in the Father and the Father yet that, I, that is, he is in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. Um, one other passage I was thinking of here that I don't know why I did not include. Uh, they asked... Right after the, this, they ask, will they, they say to Jesus, show us, here it is, it's verse 8, show us the Father. Show us the Father. Jesus answered, have I been so long with you, and you don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So how can you even ask, show us the Father? If you know me, you have known the Father. Right. All of that is just to demonstrate Jesus reveals God. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. And so if you want to know who God is or what he is like, Jesus is your answer. Jesus reveals God. Okay, I am really stretching at your patience here because uh, we should take a break. But I'll just show you one more, and that's scripture. So I just argued last time that um, the preeminent expression of God's revelation is Jesus together with scripture. And underneath scripture, we're going to talk about that at a lot more length. All I will just say here is that scripture is the thing that records all of these other things. Scripture records the revelation of the prophets. It records the, the unusual means. It records Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. So scripture functions like the record of all of these other things. Right? And so God has revealed himself over the last 6,000 years, but scripture records it for you in 2019 so that you can know all these things. And then scripture interprets for you. What do these things mean? It explains the meaning of this revelation. Okay, let's take a break. So uh, I have 9.43, and maybe we'll just go until 9.55, 
Bye bye. We'll take like a 12 minute break. Come back at 9.55 and pick up here with a few more concepts and, um, and then we'll go from there. Okay, great. We just had a, a kind of an interesting discussion on the chat. Thinking for a little bit. And uh, so if you're online, you can just see that there. Actually, if you're here as well, you can read the chat later. Just let me know. If you message me, I can send you the transcript. Um, but we were just discussing kind of the, the standard hypothetical people that are on an island somewhere and they are worshiping idols. Uh, and so is that a kind of a seeking after God if they've never received any kind of revelation? So it's a hard question. I'm not going to. One foundation I want to start with is just to say there's no simple answer here on the fate of the unevangelized. So actually, I would encourage you to avoid simple answers on these kinds of things. We're tempted. Okay, ganon, ganon, ganon. I solved it. Don't. You didn't solve it. I promise. So that would be one foundation for me. Uh, this is not a simple thing to just solve. Uh, but then secondarily, uh, we just talked about the foundations that we talked about last week. And so I'm going to end up looking through those foundations. Jesus is the only means of salvation. There is a requirement of special revelation that you have to hear in order to be saved. And God has always cared about the salvation of all people. So God is, it's not that I, it's not that I am very concerned about these people on the island and God says, whatever. It's not like that. God loves them way more than I do. So I don't need to defend the people on the island or something. I mean, God cares about them more than me. Um, but then from there, those are foundations, but then we go down into possibilities. Is it possible maybe God would send them special revelation? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, does God show special mercy to people who never heard? Maybe, be careful. Okay, so there's possibilities like that. But to put that into the context of Romans 1, uh, the, the concept of Romans 1 is that they are, when they are worshiping the idols, that is not an expression of them seeking God. That is an expression of them suppressing the truth. And the truth, uh, to answer the question on the chat, the truth is, the truth that they're suppressing in the context of Romans 1 is the general revelation. In other words, Paul's argument, and maybe the easiest thing, go back and read through uh, Romans 1 later. Paul's argument in Romans 1 is, God has given lots of information, his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So they can know a lot. They can know a lot about the nature of God. And we even talked about things. They can know his power, his care, his goodness, his love. They can know a lot about things through the image of God. They can know a lot of things. Okay, But guess what? Even though they can know a lot of things about God, they still go out and make idols. And they try to pretend that God is like an animal. Does that even make sense? The God who made the world, a God who is so powerful, he creates a world. He has to be bigger than the world, right? In order to create a world. And so then we're going to have this little like turtle or something. And we're going to say this little wooden turtle. He is the one who made me. Does that even make sense? See, And so Paul's argument goes, they can know a lot about God if you just look around you, but they suppress that. They reject it. They turn from it. So I want to argue that something like idol worship is not an expression of, oh, those cute natives, they're really trying to find God. They're not trying to find God. They're running from him. It's more of an expression of like a Jonah run away than it is a trying to find God. Okay? And that's dark, but it is, that's what's going on in Romans 1. Okay, uh, so that's that. What I'm going to do here now, give me a second. Let me get myself a little bit more organized. Uh, we are finishing the Revelation chapter, and we've worked through trying to talk through those. Um, I'll just do this because I, I think I already talked at some sufficient length explaining what I meant with these. But here, just... So you see these points. These points would be really, really good for you to have in your mind for the test uh, or just for your, for your own personal life. 
So these points, redemptive revelation has been given to specific people. The kind of, the, the idea that um, God has given his word to us as stewards. Okay, so general revelation is for the entire world. It's all there. But part of what's going on with the redemptive revelation is you are, as a recipient of redemptive revelation, you are blessed. Don't waste the blessing. That's the concept. You are blessed. Don't waste the blessing. Go tell somebody. You are blessed. You are one of the blessed. Redemptive revelation has been given progressively. So this is the difference between general and redemptive. Uh, in other words, Adam could look around the Garden of Eden and all of the general revelation is already there. But all that Adam has is like the blessing or excuse me, the words of God to him. That's all he has. Walapashang New Testament. Walapashang Book of John or the coming of Jesus or gun and gun. So the concept of uh, redemptive revelation or special revelation, what comes to us in scripture, the difference or one of the big differences here is that it grows over time. And I'll just give that to you. Let me draw a diagram for you. Over time, God is revealing more and more of this truth so that in Genesis, they just have a little bit. And by the time you come to Revelation and the full New Testament, we have a lot. Okay. So from creation to 2019, obviously more specifically, I should say like about, you know, 100 AD or something when Revelation was finished, the revelation has grown. God has given you more and more, right? So it wasn't, God did not just give you, here's the Bible, whole thing, already bound in a leather cover. He didn't give it to you like that. He gave it to you in pieces over time. Here's Moses. Here's later, you know, David writing in the Psalms. Here are the prophets. Here are the gospels. Here are the epistles. Here's Reverend. Okay, see, he piled it up over time. Okay, so that's one of the concepts here where redemptive revelation is, is very different than general revelation. And then one or two other ideas, only redemption, redemptive revelation is able to save. And that would just be some of the concepts I've already talked about probably way too much now, thinking through the fate of the unevangelized. But that's supporting this. Only those who have heard God's words in the gospel could really be saved. Um, and we, we just, these passages require that, that's all. It's, I, I'm not calling that a simple thing to teach. It's just the passages require. Okay, that's all I will do for this chapter on uh, Revelation. Any questions before we keep on moving? Because the next thing we come to is inspiration, which gets really interesting. Uh, let me just look at our schedule and see what my original plan was. But I think we're right on track if I remember correctly. Uh, good. Actually, we're a little behind, I should move it a little, little faster to catch up, but we'll be okay. Um, so talking about inspiration, let's start out with basically just this as a foundation. What is inspiration anyway? And uh, to put this into terms of the previous chapter, so in the previous chapter, I talked about all these different kinds of special revelation, right? So under uh, redemptive revelation, excuse me, sorry, I know this is like whiplash. Um, I talked about dreams and visions, God speaking directly, the unusual means. We talked about angels, prophets, Christ, and then scripture, right? Okay, what I'm doing in the next chapter is I'm taking this scripture and I'm building an entire chapter on that, all right? So the entire, every, basically everything else for the rest of the course focuses on this one form of revelation. So God has revealed himself uh, we can do this in a chart if we want. God has revealed himself in lots of different, two different categories, the general revelation and the special or redemptive revelation. So underneath the general revelation, uh, I could talk about if this is general or universal. Uh, let me write universal. Underneath universal, and I could talk about under his creation, his providence, the image of God. Okay. So God has spoken in lots of different ways under general revelation. 
Okay, now if I move that in a little bit, excuse me. If I move that in a little bit and now I talk about redemptive revelation, here's the second category of things, okay? Underneath here, then I can talk about a whole other set, a whole other set of ways that God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself by speaking directly, by dreams and visions, by angels, by prophets, by Jesus, and by scripture, okay? Now, what I'm doing for the rest of the course is I'm taking this scripture and we're zooming in on it. Okay, does that make sense in terms of the organization of the course so far? So general revelation and all of the different means, direct speech, uh, the creation, excuse me, not direct speech, cancel that. Creation, providence, uh, marriage, humans, image of God over here, then direct speech and prophets and dreams and angels and Jesus. But scripture is the thing we're going to zoom in on. That's what we're doing in the next chapter. Okay. So when I talk about inspiration, inspiration is the process where God gave us scripture. That's the simple, simple summary of what is inspiration. It's the process where God gave us scripture. Um, and that, that here to give you an introduction. Um, it seems less obvious that 40 different writers writing in three different languages across 1,500 years are speaking for God. I mean, I, I could say something like this. In terms of obvious revelation, it would be very obvious to me, wow, God has spoken. If like a cloud opened up and light shone down, and then a voice spoke, and God said, here is my word for you, or something. Like that. Wow, that's clearly God. Okay. But the idea that a bunch of Jewish guys would write down their words on pieces of papyrus, and those words on pieces of papyrus, that is the word of God. That's, kind, that's wow, very interesting idea. And so how would I support the idea that scripture is in fact God's words? Okay, well, let's start with this. We can start from the very beginning. And the very beginning on a doctrine of inspiration, the idea that, say something like, God's words will not just be spoken from clouds, but God's words will be written. That idea. The idea that God's words will be written starts all the way back in Exodus 32:16. Exodus 32, God has given already his law, Exodus 20. But now Moses goes up into Sinai and he receives tablets of stone, two chunks, two big pieces of stone. So he walks off of Mount Sinai with two rocks in his hand. Okay? And the two rocks he's holding in his hand have written on them writing. And here's what it says. The tablets were the work of God the writing, I'm, this is from, right from Exodus 32, 16. And the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. God wrote. In other words, at the very, this is the interesting thing about this. At the very beginning of the story of inspiration, it's not even, at the very beginning, it's not that Moses wrote. The very first start on this, the first time we get the, oh, God doesn't just speak, but God writes. The first time we discover that God wants his word not just to be spoken, but to be written, the first time we experience that, we find that God himself is the writing. And he's writing in rocks with his finger burning, I don't know. Somehow in his finger, he's writing on rocks. So actually you discover the beginning of inspiration or the beginning of this process is, is directly God, God writing. Now, what follows though, that's Exodus 32, 16. God has written the first part, but then what follows is that Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And at the end of the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 31, we find out that he has continued to write. So Moses has written all these things down. And when he writes them all down, the result is the book of the law. 
And the book of the law is echoing God's writing. So now what I get is something like this. God at the very beginning, God wrote. Okay. Now, having finished, God, God having written, later Moses wrote. But both of them, God's writing and Moses' writing, are the words of God. God's writing and what Moses wrote are the words of God. That comes later when Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. That's at the end of Joshua. And so basically the pattern goes, uh, we could do this in a diagram. Okay, starting out, if I'm tracing kind of the development of my doctrine of inspiration, or I'm developing the pattern for the idea that, that God's words would be written, the idea goes something like this. God writes. Okay, a little bit later, Moses writes. A little bit later, Joshua writes. See the pattern? And the, the, there's a direct continuation here. God started the process. But now later when Moses writes for him, the writing that Moses does is also the words of God. And later when Joshua writes these things down, the things that Joshua writes down are in fact the words of God. So we have this pattern getting set, even as we keep on walking across from the, that very beginning, that very first start. Uh, it's not just that. Much later, God also commands Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. God tells them, write down this message. Right? And so they're all commanded by God to write. Um, a passage I, or a concept I did not include in here, and maybe I should, would be the very strong pattern with thus saith the Lord all through the prophets. Okay, so, but you realize what's going on here. You've got Isaiah or Jeremiah or somebody else saying things, right? So Jeremiah says such, 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 such. But when Jeremiah speaks, those are God's words. Wait, I thought Jeremiah, Oh, shangnagsabi. Right. Thus says the Lord. And Jeremiah is speaking, but actually underneath it, it's, it's God actually speaking. Uh, let me just make a note for my... Well, I'll have to come to that later. All right, so that is with the prophets. And then now we move into the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance. He will declare to you the things that are to come. That, all of that kind of not a promise to us that God will teach me all truth or something like that. I would primarily understand that language as mostly focused on the apostles. So I will guide the apostles, he said, to speak or write the truth. And so now if I'm doing this line across, God wrote, Moses wrote, Joshua wrote, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the prophets wrote, the apostles wrote because Jesus commanded them to write, okay? So I put all of those pieces together, and I've got a pretty good foundation for our whole concept here that God wants his words not just to be spoken, he wants his words to be written. Uh, in Acts 4, the apostles remember, the sovereign Lord who made the heaven and earth has spoken by the Holy Spirit, okay? But think about what they just said. They just said the one who spoke in Psalm 2 was God. God spoke in Psalm 2. All right? So, says Psalm 2? God. God is the one speaking. Okay. God spoke through the mouth of our father David. And so I have a very interesting pattern here already getting set. Human beings speak or human beings write. But when the human beings write, or when they speak, I discover it was actually God speaking. It was actually God standing behind it. Okay, several observations. Number one, what the human authors have written is not their message. It is God's message recorded by them. Number two, as a result, the documents carry God's own authority. So that you can say, Moses wrote this, or you can say, God spoke this, 
tama din yun. You can say Moses wrote this and that's correct, that's true. Or you can say God spoke this and that's also equally true. Okay, uh, let me show you an example or just um, try to illustrate this out for you. So let's see. Uh, the question I'm going to ask here for a few minutes is, who wrote the Bible? When I read the Bible, whose voice is speaking? Okay. And uh, this question matters to me because it comes up sometimes. I have had conversations with somebody, something like this, where they say, you know, I, I, like I'll be teaching and I'll say, um, so here, Moses said this, or Paul taught this, or Peter says this. And somebody says, no, you shouldn't say Peter taught this. You should say God taught this. Okay. So you tell me, what do you think? Who wrote the Bible? Another way of asking this, what should I say? Is it legitimate for me? Is it okay for me to say something like what Paul said in Romans or what Moses said in Deuteronomy? Or would it, better for me, would it be better for me to always say something like what God said in the Psalms? what God said in Hebrews, what God said in John. What do you think? Give me a little bit of feedback. Brother Paul, I will, uh, I'll call on you in a second. Uh, what do you think? Uh, process this thing a little bit. Is it good to say, is it okay to say what Paul said in Romans? Is it okay to say what Moses said in Deuteronomy? Or should I be more accurate? Would it be more accurate for me to only ever say what God said in this or that passage? What do you think? Brother Paul, what do you think? Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, you're more inclined to stick with uh, what God said. Okay. All right. I like that. I think that's good. What do you think? Can you give me any biblical basis for this? Is there any biblical support? I like what you, what you said. It's good. Is there any biblical idea I can give in here that would connect some of this together? A biblical support for the idea that I could say Moses said or Paul said, and Hindi maling. Hindi maling sabihin, it's not wrong to say when Moses said this or when Paul said this. What do you think? Any ideas? Okay. I, no, no worries. So you, you can do something like this. This is very legitimate. Uh, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I think maybe that you're thinking of that passage. Oh, right, listen to that. Holy men of God spoke, or I, I'll just put in names. Moses, David, and Jeremiah spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So if you say something like, don't say that Jeremiah or Psalms or Deuteronomy was written by Moses. Actually, no, scripture said that Moses, David, Jeremiah said these things. Uh, here, I'll go a little further. Anyone, uh, well, I'm going to look at the chat because I see a little bit of chat activity here. Um, okay, good. We say the author says to let the audience know where the reference comes from. I think you've got maybe the closest answer yet here. This is a very good clue for a broader idea, which is that the New Testament itself sets the pattern for how we can talk about what God has said. Um, here, nice. Uh, Ma Marina said here, she gave a reference and I put it into the chat. Uh, so Jesus says to the leper, go offer yourself as proof. And then what he says, for your cleansing, what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Okay, so here's my answer, my simple answer. Someone who says, you sh shouldn't say Moses said it because it's not Moses who said it, it's God who said it. My simple answer to that guy is, okay, I mean, I'm, I like what you're saying. I like your point. 
The Bible is God's word, not human words. So the Bible I'm holding is not just hindi lang salita ng mga tao yun. Hindi producto, producto ng isip ng mga tao. It's not just the product of human thinking. I like that. On the other hand, the Bible itself says things like Moses said, David said, Isaiah said. In fact, for you to say it's wrong to say Moses said this, you're actually being more theological. You're not really. But you're pretending to be more theological than the Bible. Because the Bible will say Moses said this. Jeremiah said this, Isaiah said this. Let me show you some, some examples. Here's a big list of verses talking about the human author. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. And he quotes something. Matthew 3, then was spoken of the, by the prophet Isaiah. Then it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah. Then it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah. Then it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah. Then it's fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy to you? Why did Moses command to give a writing? How then did David in spirit call him Lord? If David call him Lord, how is he a son? This was spoken by Jeremiah. I am the voice of the one in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As said by the prophet Isaiah, Moses and the law commanded us that the saying of Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. These things said Isaiah. Okay, and I mean, I could keep on reading. There's a bunch more. The point is, if you start looking at it, there are a ton of passages where the New Testament itself says, Isaiah said. Moses said, Jeremiah said, okay. And so then for me to step up and say, don't say jo Moses said it. Don't say Jeremiah said it. Say that God said it. Well, I mean, sorry. I'm just following the example of the New Testament because the New Testament itself does this. Does that make sense? Okay. Now here's where this gets really interesting and, and thick and actually uh, beautiful. You have another set of passages here that show the divine author. So watch what happens here. I'll show you a, a, a group of other passages. Here, he's going to quote the Old Testament. This is an Old Testament quote. He that cursed father and mother, let him die the death. That's an Old Testament quote. Galing Old Testament here. But honor thy father and mother. That's an Old Testament quote. Okay? But watch this. For God commanded, say. And what follows is a quote from a writing by Moses. Moses wrote the words on a piece of papyrus. Moses wrote the words, but, but Jesus can say, God commanded that. So even though Moses wrote it on the papyrus, those were God's words. Here's another, Acts 13. Um, when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. God did. To whom he also gave testimony, God did, and said, God said, I have found David the son of Jesse. God speaking in the Old Testament. We declare unto you glad tidings, the promise which was made unto our fathers, God hath fulfilled. Okay, so there you go. There's your pronoun, or there's your, your subject. God has fulfilled, in that he raised up Jesus again, as it is also written, thou art my son, this day hath I begotten thee. And concerning he that raised him up from the dead, now more to return unto corruption, he said. Okay, so the question we're asking, this is, sorry to bring grammar. You know, nobody ever likes it when you bring grammar into a discussion. But you have to ask yourself, uh, what is the antecedent? What is the antecedent of the he? Okay, so here, let me make this uh, oops, a screenshot. Here, I said, he said, right? The he said. And the question is, who is the he? And if I trace back up through the passage, God is the he. So God said, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Well, so he's quoting from the Old Testament. And yet, when he quotes from the Old Testament, it's actually God speaking. All right. Uh, one or two more other examples. Uh, as he said also in Hosea, this is, uh, excuse me, maybe I got the wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen to this. Uh, in context, as he said also in Hosea. In Hosea, that's the reference. But who said it? God said it. I will call them my beloved. And one more, Christ also glorified himself not to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's from Psalm 2. It also is quoted in the baptism. But here's Psalm 110, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He saith, God saith. God's the one speaking. Okay. So what I get here, if I put this into chart form, goes something like this. Um, 
here is the scripture, the Old Testament state. And so if I ask something like, who said this? Right? Who said this scripture? If that's my question, then actually I discover there are two, oops, two possible answers to that question, and either one is correct. Who said this? I can answer that question, God said this. Or I can answer that question, David slash Moses slash Jeremiah said this. This is correct. This is also correct. Who said the words in the book of Ephesians? The answer, God said those words. Also, by the way, Paul said those words. Either one of those is true. They're both true. And the reason I can say that freely and not be afraid is because scripture itself does it. I have a bunch of verses showing the divine author. I have a, a, a whole other group of verses showing the human author. And they're both there, okay? Both human authors, that's legitimate, that's legitimate. Both of them from scripture themselves. Those two, human authors, divine authors, it's all there. And it's all there illustrating basically this notion that with a single word of scripture, I can say that God said it or I can say that a human said it. Both of those are true. Let me show you, because I'm not quite done showing you the pattern. Um, so let's go back again. And let's look at one more set. And this is verses doing both. Okay. So um, look at Matthew 122. It was all done, then it might be fulfilled, which was spoken. Okay. This is, this is just the marvel of this. Then it might be spoken what was spoken of the Lord. So according to that statement, who is the one speaking in this, in this prophecy? God, okay? By the prophet. Both are there. God spoke, and he spoke by the prophet. I've got the same thing right in the next one, by the prophet, but actually the whole time I discover it was spoken of the Lord. God spoke by the prophet. Okay, here's one more. Here is, uh, sorry, switching my colors. Will you let me go back? There you go. Here is, okay, God who made heaven and earth. God spoke. God has said, right? And yet, how did God say it? And the answer is, God said it by the mouth of thy servant, David. So who spoke? God spoke. But he spoke by David. And both of those Kind of, if I do my diagram again, both of those here. It is both God speaking and it is David speaking. Okay, uh, so I have a group of passages that do that. And then one more just to illustrate or close this out. I have one more kind of fun example. Here's two passages, okay, and just so I make the idea clear, um, let me make this a little bigger and I'll highlight some of these out. Okay, so I have here, should be clear enough, the same statement, okay? Honor thy father and mother. Down here, honor thy father and mother. In fact, even the second part, he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. He that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. So, should be clear enough, I don't think there's any problem here, recognizing this is the same thing as that. Right? Correct? Good. Great. Okay, so now that we've established that, that is the same as that. We got that all fixed up. Everything's fine. You tell me, who is the one who spoke those words? And what I discover in Matthew is God commanded. And what I discover in Mark is Moses commanded. And if somebody says, aha, I found a contradiction in the Bible. In one place it said God said it. And in the other place it said Moses said it. The answer of the scripture is, no, that's not a contradiction, silly. You don't understand the truth. God spoke it and Moses spoke it. Both are true. Okay, I think that helps us get the foundation for our basic bibliology, and it's, it's a very important foundation to recognize in inspiration, it is God speaking, and it is the person speaking. Both are true at the same time. Okay, I'll keep on explaining or building that idea out. Any questions there just for starters? Okay. Um, so let's keep on looking and kind of build this concept out a little bit with the process of inspiration. What we did so far was just to talk about how this has to work. 
but let's talk about the process. Several passages give us a window into how inspiration actually happened. 2 Samuel 23 records the last words of David. So this is David talking. But if I go to the passage, I discover this. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. And the result is that God has spoken. Okay? So it's, it should be clear here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pull this in so we can just see this within scripture itself. It should be clear enough, I think, I hope, that this is David speaking. Right? David is writing in this psalm. So we have no problem or should have no problem there. Just a second. Um, where did you go? Here you are. Okay, it should be clear enough that David is the one speaking in this psalm. These be the, here it is. These be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said. All right, so David is talking. But look at verse 2. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was in my tongue. And I think this, 2 Samuel 23, 2, it's in the Old Testament, uh, is already setting for you a foundation of how inspiration happened. What was it like? How did it work? How did it happen? David spoke, he spoke the normal way, he used his tongue. I mean, there were, in other words, it wasn't like here, you know, here inspiration is about to happen and suddenly, ah, oh, ooh, and he's floating and he's having an, some kind of like paranormal state. And then a strange voice comes out of his mouth. It's not his voice. It's some deeper voice than, you know, it's, it's not like that. David just, David just talks. David talks, but when he talks, the spirit of the Lord is speaking by him. Okay. So second Samuel 23, two gives you kind of an early, um, kind of an early illustration or something of how this would work. How about now let's go to second Peter one twenty one, And this was the one that brother Paul alluded to earlier. Okay. In context, let me uh, just show you the context. Um, He's making the point in verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We actually were there at the transfiguration. We heard his voice from heaven. So we were, and if you think about the transfiguration, the transfiguration was the ultimate exclusive experience. Hindi lahat lahat palataya. Okay, it was only the disciples who were alive during the time of Jesus. Hindi lang pala yung mga nabubuhay sa panahon ni Jesus. It's not just the people who are alive during the time of Jesus. It's only disciples. And hindi lang mga disciplo. It's not just disciples. It's three. An exclusive group. So this is like exclusive, exclusive, exclusive. The tiniest little group. They have special privilege. But, he says we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is scripture. So if you had a choice, I said this last week, if you had a choice, you could either be at the transfiguration and see the glory of Jesus and hear the voice say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, that's option one. Option two, you can have a Bible. Which one should you pick? Easy, Bible, easy. Yeah, but what an experience. Yeah, and then it's over. Bible. Pick the Bible. Right? That's the logic of it. Knowing this first, the no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. What does that mean? We didn't make it up. No prophecy of Scripture is a private thing. The prophecy came not in old time by the will of men. We could not decide. It's not like Paul could sit down and say, or Peter, excuse me, sit down and say, I think I'll write a book of the Bible now. That's not the way it works. You don't just decide. Now is the time for me to speak for God. You don't decide like that. God decides. But here's the way it works. Holy men of God spake. The, the, the people, the prophets legitimately said things. They legitimately spoke and when they spoke, it was the words of the living God. They spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I don't want to get too um, analytical here, but this moved. There's a possibility here even of a little bit of wordplay-ish. This word in at least one context is used of like the wind blowing on a ship 
And so the, the ship is kind of moved along by the wind. Okay, I don't want to bring all of that into the passage. I don't think that's necessarily built into what's happening here. But it maybe is an illustration, at least something like that. In other words, the ship on the ocean, it's not like the ship decides where to go. The wind blows the ship. Okay. And so if you wanted to do that kind of direction, something like Peter, Paul, Moses, they're not, in a sense, they're not make. yeah, I mean, clearly, they're not making it up. It's God's words through them. God's speaking through them. Okay. That's that. And then let's do one more. So I, I'm giving you three key passages on inspiration. Uh, it would be a very, I think actually this is one of your questions, your, your preparation questions for the class. And the question is, what are the three key passages? You should know these three key passages. You should just be able to tell me what they are. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete is the way I would understand verse 17. That the man of God may be complete, completely furnished for every good works. Every, every good work. Everything that the man of God is supposed to do, he's able to do because God has given that to him in his word. God has made that available to him. Okay, um, we quote this a lot. We talk about it, but we may not understand it. So let's, let's make sure we understand what's going on in this. So start out with this. When Paul says all scripture, what's he referring to? And actually, at the time, Paul would have been basically referring to the Old Testament, right? Because the, the New Testament is not yet written. Now, there are other reasons, and I, I, can, I can talk about this idea later, why this would also include all of the New Testament. There are places in the New Testament where it refers to itself as Scripture, so I'm not saying by this, this only applies to the Old Testament. I am saying by this, though, when he uses this word scripture, he's referring to all the writings that have been received from God. Okay, all of that scripture, all of these writings that have been received from God are given by inspiration. And so that, that means is they're breathed. Inspiration, uh, if you if do something like um, exhaling, all scripture is given by in exhaling of God. Okay. Or another, you know, it, it basically the concept of it goes, when I'm talking, what is talking? Talking is the process of forcing air. You're forcing air past an instrument, the same way you play a trumpet. Okay. You're, you're doing the same thing with your voice. And so that air is what's creating the sound. And so the sound that goes out is actually the result of my, the air, my breath, right? And so you can prove this just, you know, you talk. And, and as you're talking, there's puffs of air that are hitting my finger, right? I can feel the puffs of air hitting. Okay, so the speech is air. Okay, that's kind of the picture he uses here. God is exhaling his words. God is talking. Or all scripture is the talking of God. It's the breath of God. It's God talking and his words are coming out. And that's scripture. So what you're holding in the Bible you have is the result of God speaking. These are God's words. Okay, where the rest of the verse breaks, breaks down, like structurally, this word right here, it's profitable, it's sufficient for these four things. One, two, three, four. Okay, those four things for a purpose that the man of God can be, com can be complete completely fit, prepared, and finished for everything he ought to do. Okay, so that's the way the flow of the verse goes. The point I want you to get from, for the purpose of our discussion right now, is this right at the beginning. What is scripture? Scripture is what happens when God breathes out his words. And so the words we have in this book, these words are the record or they are the result of God speaking. God communicating his words. Okay, that's basically the core content that we have biblically on what inspiration means. When you hear the word inspiration, inspiration is just a word for breath. And so all you're hearing when they say inspiration is God has talked, has spoken. His breath, the way that I speak, I use breath to speak, God has spoken. That's all we're saying with inspiration. 
Scripture is the words of God. It's the breath of God. It's God communicating his truth. Okay, any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Uh oh, yes, good question. She asked, can we say all of the words in the Bible I have are the words of God? And the answer, absolutely. So the Bible I hold is the words of God. And I don't have to be afraid of saying the, the language that boldly, that directly. The Bible is the word of God, or these are God's words. These are God's words. Uh, put that back into our flow that we did earlier. Think, think of it from the very beginning, God writing with his finger on a rock. And then from that just develops the whole pattern I see. I mean, so that, that beginning of, of God writing, the first time I see, the first time I discover, oh, God's words will be written words. First time I discover that, it was actually God writing, physically writing. And so then I look at my Bible and I say, this is God's word, or these are God's words. Now, we'll get into some of the details later. Clearly, God did not write his words in English. So then we have a discussion about that translation and what, how all of this works. All right. So we understand that. You know that. Uh, but it is still very, very valid, legitimate for me to look at my Bible. This is God's word. The Bible I'm holding is God's word. Okay, we'll talk about reasons, some of the details for that later. Any other questions? Good question. Anyone in the chat? I'm just looking, make sure I've kept up with the chat, but it looks good. Okay, if there aren't any questions, we'll take a break. Oh, wait in a month. Oh, wow. Great. Good. So let's, that's a very good passage for us to talk about because it might be one of these things you wonder about. Um, so I, are, I, know I, I know I did use the word break. I know the word break was spoken. See if you can keep your mind uh, still in class because we'll take a break in just a little bit. But let's take a moment. Let's look at this passage. That's, that's worth it. Uh, or we should definitely should think about it for a second. Okay. So what he's discussing in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, he's talking about marriage, and basically the question is going, forgive the over, over, overly uh, rushed summary, the question is going, should you get married or not? And it says, uh, I was asked this about this just a little bit ago. I was asked in a class here at uh, BJMEC just the other day, is, um, does God expect all of us to get married? Are we supposed to get married or something? So if a person doesn't get married, are they somehow sinning and disobeying God? So, so then we start asking a question about Christianity in general. Uh, other religions would say something like, it's more holy or something if you choose not to get married, right? The Catholic priests. So it's somehow a more holy thing to be unmarried. And so what that tells you is the better position is the unmarried position. The married position is kind of like inferior or something, okay? So some people would go that way. Other groups or ways of thinking or culture or whatever would say something like, you're inferior if you're not married. And so the married people are more something, mature or something, I don't know. But cultures will do that to us too, okay? And so I come to 1 Corinthians 7, does Christianity have a view on this? Does Christianity teach us that marriage is better, singleness is inferior, or singleness is better, marriage is inferior, okay? And so I start working through the passage, and basically, Paul practically discusses with them through the passage, okay, there are going to be some benefits to getting married, there are going to be some benefits to staying single, and either one, either one has pros and cons. <laughs> there are pros and cons to both, okay? And so just recognize that. In fact, he says, if you're married, great. Stay married, of course, right? That's the, if you're married, stay married. What? Oh, but I should have been single, so I'll divorce my wife. What? Okay, so if you're married, stay married. If you're single, 
and, and in God's leading for you, you're able to serve him better that way? Great, serve God that way. Even, and this is, some of the, this is some of the practical theology that's helpful, even if you say something like, I kind of would like to get married, but God hasn't led that way, okay, serve him single until he changes your status, right? Just do, do it. You can pray even, Lord, I still would love to get married. You can still pray that way. That's fine. Uh, you can still pray that way and think that way, but, but don't let that ruin your life. As in every morning you wake up and, why am I not married? Every, it, come on. So go serve God. Go serve God. Right? All right? In the same way that a married person should not wake up in the morning. Why do I have the burden of providing for this family? You're married. Just serve the Lord married. Or you're single. Just serve the Lord single. Okay? Make sense? So when I get further down here, though, I have some really interesting passages, like, I speak this by permission, not of commandment. So verse six, it sounds like he's saying, if you said something, oh, so he's not speaking with authority here or something. It's like, here, uh, if we did this graphically, it's almost like um, it could sound a little bit to us, and I'm gonna disagree with this, but it could sound like, okay, all of this, this is all scripture, and uh, this is down here is scripture. This part right here, because he said, I speak this permission. This is just Paul's opinion. So that's not like authority. Ay, sorry, huh? That's not like authority in the same way that the other is. That's the way some people would understand this. I speak this by permission, not by commandment. Wrong. I disagree. I completely disagree. What's going on here? What's going on here is very simple. His, his concern, why he says, I speak this by permission, not of commandment. He's saying, I'm not telling you that you should stay single. I'm not telling you that you have to stay single. Meaning, Paul, uh, uh, one way of saying this, Paul is not teaching the Catholic thing. If you're a good priest, a good pastor, you'll be single. He's saying, I'm saying this by permission. And he's saying, I think, it, I think there would be some advantages in ministry to stay single. You'll be able to do more in ministry if you're single. Fact. All right. I, I notice here, I notice in a lot of the churches, local churches, a lot of the work is getting done. A lot of the activity is happening by the young professional singles. They're the ones who are like creating the cantata. They're the ones that are planning out this event. They're the ones that are going to the place and getting it reserved and making it prepared and everything like that, okay? And why is that happening? Because people like me are so busy trying to keep up with family and everything else, voila, voila coming extra time, okay? Last week I saw May Manares and she was coming out to our church in, uh, in uh, Malabon and she was there in the morning to work on a cantata thing. And then she went to another church in the evening to work on a cantata thing. And then she'll turn around and do it again in the weekend. And the next Sunday, she just, I can't do that. I can't do that. So his idea is, if you stay single, you can do more in ministry. But the point of this, I speak this by permission. He said, I'm not telling you being a good Christian means stay single. In fact, if you keep on going further down, you see, he'll say, if you're married, serve the Lord as a married guy. Married lady. If you're single, serve the Lord as a single lady. Single guy. All right. Later in the passage, I know. Either way. Okay, now notice the distinction here. Watch this comparison between this. I speak this by permission, not by commandment. But down here, unto the married, I command. Not I, but the Lord. The Lord commands, and what he's going to say down here is, don't get divorced. So the distinction here is not to say, like up here, ako lang, palagay ko lang, sa palagay ko lang. It's not it. Sa palagay ko lang, in my opinion, that's not it. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, there is flexibility here. Some believers will be single and serve the Lord. Amen. Some believers will be married and serve the Lord. Amen. All I did knew it. There's flexibility here. When I get down here, this kind of language I command, 
Divorce, no flexibility, <laughs> right? No, you don't do something like, oh, well, you know, some believers, they get married, then they get tired of their wives, so they just divorce them, and that's okay. It's not okay, right? Divorce does happen. It's sad. It's always tragic when it happens. It's always tragic, always tragic. No exceptions, always tragic, right? There's never, oh, that was a lovely divorce. It's always tragic, okay? And so he's going to say this is a command. But up here on things like whether you get married or not, Either way, okay. So the point of this, when you put all this together, this passage is not saying something like, okay, this is not inspiration. No, it's all inspired. It's just to say, there are some things in scripture where God says, don't commit immorality. If you're married, don't get divorced, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Absolute command, okay? And there's other things when God says, if you want to serve me single, great. If you want to serve me, Mary, fine. And that's what's happening. Right. And I, if, if you read the, down through the passage that way, all of a sudden, oh, okay, it makes sense. Bala. That's the concept of it. Any questions that does that answer the, the question or anyone else want to follow up with that? Does that help the passage make sense? So reject the idea that itong section ay palagay ni Paul lang. No, it's not, none of it's an opinion of Paul. All of it is spoken from God. But God's point here is to say, I'm not telling you whether to get married or not. I'm telling you, if you are married, serve me. If you're not married, serve me. Some Christians will be married, some won't. This is a flexible point, okay? Should I get divorced or not? That's not flexible. See, that's his, that's his concept. Good. I'm very glad that came up. I'm glad you asked that. I should add that to my notes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we went a little bit longer again, but this is good. If we take fewer breaks, or if we go longer, we take fewer breaks, or whatever. We finish early or something. So it's 10.56. Let's go up until 11.10. So we'll take like a 15-minute break. And then Yulang, uh, we'll do until 11.10. Then we'll finish out our time and I'll add up the amount of time, and I think I can give you extra time at the end. We can finish early because we've taken longer sections. So, Yun, I, I always measure, don't worry. I measure and I make sure you get your full break time. So, kung must make in break, must early and finish. Yun. Okay, see you back in uh, 14 minutes. I'll see you back at 11.10, 11.10. Uh, someone was asking here about the Dropbox page, <clears throat> and uh, I'll take a look at it right after in our next break. So if you are looking here, let me, those of you who are on the, um, on the online side of things, I'm dropping the link in there in case for some reason you did not get that link already. So you have that in the chat, and feel free to take a look at that. Um, okay, great. Uh, a question here, and it's a good question, was, do you think that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost? Is that a thing that could continue until now? Okay. And my basic answer there is no. Uh, my reason for that is going to be complicated. So if you want the category to put that into, the word that is used here is cessationism. And I can put that up on, um, excuse me, I can put that up on the screen as well for you. So the concept of cessationism, it's just a big theological word. If you look at it, you can actually see a big theological word for cease. And it's the teaching that this kind of revelation has ceased in the sense that we do not expect God to continue giving more and more books for the Bible. And uh, that's something I have to talk about later on. But for now, I'll just put the term up there. You can look it up in a standard, in a standard uh, book of theology, a work of theology, and they'll do some discussion about this. So why do we believe that inspiration is done? In other words, we have Revelation, you know, Genesis through Revelation, 66 books. Could there be a 67th? One of the reasons that we say no 
is when you get to Revelation, it says, if anyone adds to this book. And so you get the sense at the end of Revelation, it's closed, we're done. So that's one of the main reasons. Another main major reason is the New Testament is given either by apostles or by those who have a relationship with the apostles. All the apostles are dead. And the reason I'm not just making that up, the reason is because Jesus told the apostles, the spirit will guide you into all truth. So because the apostles were at the center, the core, the apostles doctrine, Ephesians 2, the apostles laid the foundation. It's the apostles that give this revelation. Well, the apostles are all dead. So you can't have that continuing to happen. But the conversation would get a little bit more complicated beyond that. There's other things we could talk about. Uh, we'll have to hold that for another day. Okay, um, let me do my best to finish up this uh, discussion of inspiration. So here's something that maybe is not on your radar. No, I just mean it maybe is something you've not come across before. Um, but it's worth your knowing. And that is, I'm going to argue here that um, inspiration is a good bit more human than you think. Let me explain what I mean by that, because I'm not saying by that that is not, it is uh, in any, any less than given by God. It is absolutely the words of God, right? So I'm supporting that, maintaining that, not changing that at all. Uh, but let me get this going correctly. Just notice this set of verses, and it's, it's an interesting set of passages. Um, don't think of inspiration as a trance. What I mean, don't think something like when Paul sat down and started writing the book of Romans, because it was an inspired book, all of a sudden he's like, I, I don't even know where I'm at. Where, who am I? And his finger is just magically moving or something. Actually, it's quite... He sits down and he says, I need to write a letter to the church in Rome. So it's time to write a letter to the church in Rome. So what does he do? He gets out a piece of papyrus. Actually, I should use a different Galatians. He gets out a piece of papyrus, which is the paper they use, and he gets himself a feather and he cuts it and he gets a little bit of ink and he dips it and he starts writing. Okay. But as he writes, he's thinking, you know, maybe at some point he's writing along and his stomach growls and he thinks, I should stop and eat lunch. No, I'll finish this book first. And he keeps on writing. Right? In other words, he's, it's very human. It's a very normal process of writing. And you can see different echoes or different little insights into some of this. How about this in uh, Romans? Romans 6.22. Look at this. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Okay? So, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, just for context, I'll put the verse up here together with it. Um, the, the, the book started out very clearly, who wrote this book? Paul, a servant of God. So in one one, it's very clear that Paul is the author of Rome. Who wrote Romans? One answer you could give, God. Another answer you can give is Paul. Very clear that Paul wrote this book. So then if that's true, and it is true, then in what sense is this also true that I get to the end of the book and it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle? By the way, Tertius is, um, excuse me, probably a slave name. So it's probably a name that they would use for a slave. So I, Mr. Slave, wrote this epistle. Okay. But I thought Paul wrote this epistle. So what's going on here? What do you think? Any guesses? You want to make a guess? Dina Mansaguru. Who wants to make a guess? How about, uh, I could see on the chat, anyone on the chat want to make a guess? What's going on here? I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, I thought John wrote, the, or Paul wrote this epistle. What's going on here? Yud. Tertius is a secretary. So here's what this looks like when Paul writes Romans. Here's the process of Paul writing Romans. It's something like this. Yeah, dictated someone in uh, at JSM. Hello, JSMers. Thank you for uh, thank you for your comment. So it's a dictated kind of thing in the sense. Here's Paul, and this maybe I'll try to do this for the online group. But here's Paul. He's going to write the book of Romans. Okay, 
Uh, you ready? Okay, write this down. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to those who are in Rome, greetings. Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he just keeps on talking, okay? So he's talking out loud. Over here is the secretary. Getting it all out. That's it. Okay. So we have this place very explicitly where Paul is using a secretary. So actually, in the one case of Romans, it would not be, it's not incorrect to say something. If you ask who wrote Romans, over here I had God. I wrote David. We'll put Paul in the case of Romans. And then we can even say in a kind of a secondary way, Tertius. Because in this other way, Tertius, the one who was the secretary, actually wrote. Paul gave the words, but he actually wrote them down. And in terms of how we understand our um, doctrine of inspiration here, we would just we'll put, take the David. Oops. No, never mind. Uh, how would we understand our doctrine of inspiration here? Our explanation would just need to be that God guided Tertius as well as Paul. So it's not like Tertius would be sitting over here. Paul told him, write this down. Tertius is writing it, and he's going, I don't like that idea. I think I'll change that idea. I think I'll put something else down instead. That's not, it, that never happened. Nor did Tertius write along and think, you know, he was thinking about something else, and he accidentally wrote a wrong word or something. God sovereignly guided him so that everything he wrote down was accurate. You know. So in this case, God's sovereign guidance would be extended to Paul as well as to Tertius. God be, would be working with both. Okay, it's not only the case of uh, Romans. Actually, Jeremiah also has this. So Baruch the scribe. Jeremiah gave the words, gave the teaching. Baruch the scribe wrote it down. And so Jer Baruch the scribe served as Paul's, or as Jeremiah's secretary. And probably there are other books that work this way. Um, our guess is other books in, of Paul's epistles are also written by a secretary. Because in Galatians, he'll say, see, I, Paul, wrote this with my own hand. But in an impression, what they were expecting is that Paul was using a secretary. So in the book of Galatians, he says, this time I'm writing by my own hand. You can see. see. So it probably sounds like maybe others or maybe even most of Paul's epistles were written for secretary. Okay, that's an interesting example. Here's an interesting example, another one. Um, this is in the middle of writing Revelation. So I saw another mighty angel come down. The angel is clothed with a cloud and a rainbow. He had his, a book. He cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. When he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. Okay, so what's going on? John is writing the book of Revelation. He, he receives the seven, sees the seven seals. He writes them down. He receives the other prophecies. He writes them down. So John is just writing down everything. Now these thunders happen and John starts to write them down because ganun, that's what he did for everything else. So everything else, he wrote it down. It should be here too. I'm going to write it down. When I was about to write, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things and write them not. What you realize is, even when John is under inspiration, he's under inspiration, he's under the leading of God as he's writing the book. He's writing the book, and as he's writing the book, he made a mistake. And God said, no, not that. Yes, Lord. Keeps on going. Okay, now that's not to say he made, uh, what do you say? I say it made a mistake. Anyway, it's not invalid. It's not that he made a mistake as in there might be errors in our Bible. Think about what happened. He started to do the wrong thing. God corrected him, not that. Okay, yes, Lord. And so the result was perfect. The result was what God wanted it to be, but God directed him. God gave him the direction to do it. So you might have places like that where even an author, as he's writing, starts to do the wrong thing and God says, not that, yes, Lord, because God is guiding the process. God is telling him what he should write. And then one more, this is my favorite in 1 Corinthians. Okay, um, so he's writing in 1 Corinthians 1 and they are saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos and all that stuff. And so it's a yucky, it's a yucky situation. 
Okay, and in this yucky situation where people are fighting with each other about, you know, who is their favorite apostle or something, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I have baptized in my own name, okay? What's going on here now in verse 16? And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So my reading of this, my understanding of this would go, Paul's sitting there, he's writing the book of 1 Corinthians, and he's saying, you know, it's just, it's good that I only baptized two of you, Crispus and Gaius. Because if I had baptized anybody else, you would probably act like those guys were special. So it's good that I only baptized two. Wait a minute. I also baptized the household of Stephanus by Allah. Okay, that's true. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, you know, I don't really, maybe there was somebody else, I don't remember. And what you get when you, why did he put here, verse 16, why did he put that here instead of putting it up, you know, it could have just been, but Crispus, Gaius, and the household of Stephanus. My impression, I think, what's going on here, is like parang natandaan lang niya He's reading along, I only baptized Crispus and Gaius, because if I, you would glory in that if I had baptized anybody. Ay, Stephanus pala. Tama naman pala. Oh, okay. And I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Meron pa ba? I don't think so, but in the opposite uh, Okay, I'm not sure if I baptized anybody else, but who cares? It's not important. That's the impression I get. So what you get in this text, I think, is a natural human process remembering, oh, that's right. Is there someone else? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, that's the impression you get as he's writing scripture. So my argument from all of this goes, the process of inspiration or of God giving his word is more human than we think. It's not like they just had a trance and in the trance, no, they're actually thinking, they're using words that they know, they're writing things down. You know, I, would, I think it's very fair to assume Paul's stomach grumbled at certain times while he was writing the book. Kasi gutom siya. I mean, that kind of thing. Is it possible someone needed kailangan magsiar while they're working on the book? You know, I would think certain. Okay. Um, so things like that. Okay, it's a very normal human process. However, this is where it gets interesting. God's sovereignty and inspiration extends even to preparing the lives of the authors. So here's where this goes. Um, ask something like this. When Peter wrote First and Second Peter, did he use any vocab words in that book that he did not know? And I would answer no. Lahat ng mga salita na ginamit niya, Every word he used in 1st or 2nd Peter, these were actual words that he knew in his vocabulary. Sorry, this made you distracting. Those are words that he actually knew in his vocabulary. Okay? But everything he wrote down in 1st Peter was accurate and true. How is that possible? And my argument or my concept here would be that from the beginning of their lives, in every part of their lives, God sovereignly guided the life of the author to prepare them for this book. In other words, why does Peter speak Greek? One reason, because God wants him someday to write the book of 1 Peter. Why does Moses speak Hebrew? Because someday God wants him to write Genesis through Deuteronomy. Okay, so it'll go like this, if this helps you process the idea a little bit. We'll say something like, uh, here is the book of First Peter. I wanted a square, it didn't give me a square. No? Try one more time, last try. Yes. Okay, here's the book of First Peter. Okay, every single word of this book, from eternity past, God knew exactly what it would be. So before he created the world, God knew what First Peter 1 verse 7 would say. God already knew that. Before Bago my Mundo, God already knew all of this. Okay. Now, before there was a world, before there was a Peter, 
God already knew this. The only thing he needs to do, he needs to create a Peter who will write the book. But God already knows. Alam niyang laman. God already knows what it will be. And so one day he allows a person to be born. God knows that in 1 Peter 1.1, it's going to say, Simon Peter. I think if I remember right, those are the first words of 1 Peter. God knows that it will start that way. So when this baby is born one day, and the, the, the mother is holding the newborn baby, she's just come out, and they say, what will you call this baby? And she says, I will call him Simon. Why will she call him Simon? One reason is because God knows that 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 is going to say Simon. <laughs> and so she can't name him John or James or Moses or something. She has to name him Simon because God knows he will be the author of this book. And the first word of the book is Simon. And therefore, she looks down at the baby and she says, I will call him Simon. <laughs> right? And even details like, let's say, I wrote second, first Peter, but let's go for second Peter. Second Peter chapter one, the transfiguration. Peter experienced the transfiguration. Kasama sa plano ng Panginoon. Together with the plan of God. When Peter experienced the transfiguration, God knew kasi he would be writing second Peter. And in second Peter, it says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty when we saw him in the holy mountain. So, in the plan of God, God says, Peter will be my author for Second Peter. Therefore, I need Peter to experience the transfiguration. Para siya ay magpatotoo pag nagsulat siya ng book of First Peter. In order for him to speak the truth, when he writes the book, he has to have experienced it. And so all of the experiences, the vocabulary, all of the grammar, the language, all of the things that go into making this book that book are all part of the sovereign plan of God. Somebody gave an illustration um, when they were talking about this idea. The illustration would go, if you're a great composer and you want a symphony and in the second movement of the symphony and you know, five minutes into the second movement, you want to have a solo. And you want that solo to be a powerful sound, like rich brass kind of sound. Then you just plan it and you say right there, I'm going to have this trumpet. This trumpet will play the solo. Not, a violin won't do, a double bass won't do, a xylophone won't do. I want a trumpet because I need a trumpet at that spot. Okay? But if you were going to be even more picky, you could write the symphony and say, I don't just want a trumpet, but I know the trumpet player that I want to play that. Kasi alam ko ang style niya. And so I know the trumpet player that would be perfect in that spot. And so you write your symphony for him. That has happened. Composers have written symphonies for a specific performer before. Para sa kanya talaga. And, and basically your idea goes, nobody can play this part as well as this one guy. Okay. And I, I, I'll do something like that. God already knew what his word would be. And so one day, because he needed somebody who would have the style of a Peter, like a trumpet, I need a trumpet. He creates a trumpet. He creates Peter. And all of the experiences of Peter, even the vocabulary words he knows, are all part of God's preparing this, this plan. So that Peter can write exactly the words God always wanted him to have. So in a way, the process is way more human than we think but I'll go further. The process is way more divine than we think. It was human because it was not, if it was just a trance, right? They're in a trance, uh, and then their finger just moves. Okay? That would be easy. The sovereignty of God worked like this. He used the normal human processes, and he sovereignly guided all of those processes. He sovereignly guided every detail. Para ang bawat salita sa salita ng Diyos ay exacto sa kanyang plan. He guided all of these processes so that every word would be the very words he wanted to have. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, apa. Tama. And madili naman sabihin yun. The question was, is it like the life of the apostles is sovereignly guided by God? And that's really an easy idea to support because I would go further to say, 
the life of every person is sovereignly guided by God, right? In other words, the kind of concept I'm talking about, let's say a guy, uh, I don't know, God led him to get this degree, go to this place, have this work experience, do this thing, learn this language, know these friends. And then when he's 50 years old, the Lord, after all of that preparation, puts him in an, an important ministry position. And you go, the man says something like, I realize today, God has been preparing this, me for this my whole life. It's like that. I don't know. Well, so we believe the sovereignty of God is in all, God, God is in control of this universe. So just as God controls every detail of my life, every detail of your life, God controlled the deta every detail of Paul's life, of Peter's life. Um, and, and it fits the, just our more general understanding. Okay, any questions there? Good question. Anyone else? If this helps as an illustration, uh, here's an interesting example of this kind of concept. God is writing in Isaiah. And so writing in Isaiah, he says, he will prepare Cyrus, my shepherd. God says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall perform my pleasure. And Cyrus will say to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right arm I have hold, held, to subdue nations before him. I will go before thee. I will make the crooked straights places straight. I will do all of this. I have here in verse uh, four, I have named you, even though you have not known me. Yeah. Or do I get that backwards? Anyway, do you, even though you don't know me, I have named you. I am the Lord. Okay. What's going on here? He's talking about a person, Cyrus. This person, Cyrus is a Persian king. But guess what? When Isaiah wrote these words, Cyrus was not even born. He was not even born yet. And so all the way before Cyrus was born, God can say, there will be a Cyrus. That Cyrus will become a king. And that Cyrus will rebuild my temple and my city. And God can tell you his name, his position, and what he will do. And he's not even born yet. Okay. Well, what's going to happen? One day a baby gets born. The mother holds the baby and she says, what will I name this baby? I'll call him Cyrus. Actually, I think that wasn't his birth name. It doesn't matter. I'll call him Cyrus. And then later on that child grows up and that child has leadership skills and that child becomes a king and that child ends up ruling. And all of these things are happening. They're all fulfilling God's prophecy. They're all fulfilling his word. It's just like that. So in the same way that God can direct in the life of a Cyrus and make this happen to his honor and to his glory, in the same way, God can also direct in the lives of the apostles so that the apostles end up writing the words that he wants them to write because all of that is part of his plan. Okay, if any, any other questions then? All right, let me finish out uh, one or two more pieces of this. Well... I think what we're going to do, let me go oh, jump over. That finishes out, I think, everything I want to say on inspiration. So if you have another question to ask about inspiration, this is a great time to ask it. Otherwise, I'll keep moving to a next topic. Just looking down to make sure. Here, I'll... I'll put this up for a moment or two. We can just look at this. Just, it's in your book. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, so a circular testimony. The question we're asking here, if we ask something like, how do we know that scripture is true? A lot of the arguments that we'll, we will use to prove that scripture is true actually come from scripture. So someone could say, oh, well, that's nice. Uh, you're saying that you know scripture is true, and the way you know scripture is true is because scripture told you it was true. So that's just a big circle. That's just circular reasoning, right? And it doesn't make any sense. Um, I understand their argument, and that's what I'm trying to explain in here. But my argument would go that it's not just that we believe in scripture because it claims to be true. It's, that's not, it's not just that simple. We do ultimately believe it because it, if, of the claims it makes. But actually, I can do other arguments that are much richer in a way. 
or John Frame would call these um, not as narrowly circular. Anyway, it's a little bit nerdy. But the idea are arguments like this. You have a big, massive book, and it has not ever been proven to clear, clearly have contradictions. Obviously, some people claim that it does. Other people have answers to those claims, so that's all debated. I understand. But after millennia of criticism, it still stands. It is still, I mean, fact, this is not just my view. The Bible is the most printed and read book in the history of the world. There is no other book that has been printed and read as much as the Bible. Not even close. Not even close. Okay. And that's just, when you start thinking about this book has endured 2,000 years of people trying to tear it apart. And it still stands up the test of time. That's a very strong argument for Christianity. So that's all, that's all I was trying to get at in this last section. Okay, um, if there are not questions, last chance for questions. If there not, are not questions, I will go to introducing our next topic. And our next topic is thinking about canon. Um, so someone, start here. Just what is canon in the first place? Uh, what do you think? Somebody just give me a, an, a, just a basic like definition of canon. What is canon? What do you think? Okay, good, good, good standard. We're kind of like measuring stick or something like that. Great. Um, okay, good. So that's, a, that's a, a great way to describe it. When we're talking this particularly in respect to um, the, the Bible, what do we mean by this? What is the meaning of this canon idea? Or what are the questions that we're trying to answer here? Anna Paul? Okay. The basic question we're trying to answer when we talk about canon, how do I know which books are in the Bible? All right, so we're asking questions like, how do I know that the Gospel of Thomas is not actually part of the Bible? Something like that. Okay. Um, how do I know that this or that book that claims to be, that someone claims to be scripture is not actually part of scripture? So I'm just going to set us up for that for just a brief second. In fact, here, I'll give you a moment. How would you answer a question like that? A person comes to you, and I'm, I'll give you like a two minute, just think for a minute or two, just kind of process this a little bit. Um, someone comes to you and says, I think that the Gospel of Thomas should be part of the Bible. Or here, in the Philippine uh, a Catholic says to you, you don't have the complete Bible because you're missing this section in the middle of the Bible, right? You don't have first and second Maccabees. You're missing these books. So you need to have your complete Bible. We have the complete Bible. How would you have a conversation with somebody like that? What would you say? How would you answer them? Okay, take maybe one or two minutes, write down an idea or two. What would you say? What would you give it as an answer? And then uh, we'll discuss this a little bit. Okay, one or two minutes. How would you defend that the 66 books I have in my Bible are the 66 books that God gave us? The true 66. How would you defend that? Okay, take two or three minutes. See where this goes.
Okay, who wants to share something? What, give me an idea. What would you say? Where would you start? Any ideas? Anyone from the chat want to give a concept? Okay, uh, Mamarina, they're the only ones not contradicting themselves. That's a good standard. Uh, what else? What else do you think? Um, Andrea, what do you think? Okay. All right. Uh, the books that we talk about are the books that were accepted and recognized by early believers. Good. Someone else? Yes, sir. What do you think? Good. Great. All right. So, I mean, we get asked questions like Song of Solomon or Ecclesiastes sometimes has been asked like this. Um, Luther had questions about James. Is maybe James not part of the Bible because uh, he read this part in chapter two. If Abraham had works, but not faith, can, those, can that faith save him? Or faith, but not works, can that faith save him? So there's things like that. Questions like this happen. Here, I'll show you. I'm not trying to create doubt or something, but I'll show you um, here just to kind of give you a, a sense of this. Um, here is, and I don't view, at least I, I'd have to look at it more carefully. As far as I know, there's nothing about this that is unbelief. Uh, in this list. This is a list of early Christian writings. Um, and so it's things here. You have first Thessalonians, Philippians, Galatians, first Corinthians, second Corinthians. Okay. Signs gospel. I've never read the signs gospel. Oops. Didn't mean to click the link. Uh, Didache. I have read the Didache. Gospel of Thomas. I've read tiny parts of. Um, I'm not familiar with this. Apocalypse of Ad Adam. Eunostus the Blessed, Sophia of Jesus Christ, Gospel of Mark, Epistle of James, Egerton Gospel, Gospel of Peter, Secret Mark, right? Second Thessalonians, Ephesians. And they're organizing this by date. And, and all it is is to say, hopefully we realize there were other books that Christians wrote around the same time. In other words, uh, Revelation is written all the way down here. Well, maybe so. Maybe this is a, a little liberal because they're putting some late dates here. Uh, not so bad. Uh, Revelation 90 to 95. I don't believe the Gospel of John could be as late as 120 because I believe that John actually wrote it. So like 90s. Okay, so up here is when these books are written. But there's all kinds of other books that were written before the New Testament books were written. Okay, and so basically the question we're asking here, when I ask the, the, the canon question, how do I know that Philippians, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Romans, Philemon, Colossians are in, they're part of the true Bible, but the gospel, the signs gospel or the Didache or the gospel of Thomas is, is not, it's not part of the true gospel. In fact, to take it one step further, uh, I could look at a specific example of an early Christian writing that is not included in the Bible, and yet... It's not that it's evil or something like that. So here, I'll show you. We'll just read maybe a couple of paragraphs with this. Um, being persuaded, therefore, of this, and being conscious with myself, that having said much among you, I know that the Lord journeyed with me on the way to righteousness, and I am wholly constrained also myself to this, to love you more than my own soul. For great faith and love dwelleth in you through the hope of the life that is his. Considering this, therefore, that if it shall be my care to communicate to you some portion of that which I receive, it shall turn my to my reward for having ministered to such spirits. I was eager to send you a trifle that along with your faith, you might have your knowledge also perfect. Okay. In a way, if I was not familiar with the Bible, I might read that and say, that sounds Bible-ish. It sort of sounds Bible-ish. It's not. And one of the reasons I know it's not, there's things like this. Um, I also congratulate myself hoping to be saved. Um, I, I'm not up on my interpretation of the Epistle of Barnabas, but if he's referring to that in a spiritual sense and not a physical deliverance sense, then I would say that's obviously problematic. That doesn't fit. 
the theology of the New Testament. So if you read around long enough, you see some things that are odd sounding or that don't fit a little bit. Okay, but there's other parts of this that sound like they could be part of the Bible. All right. So the question we're asking with all of this, how do we know that the 66 books we're talking about are the actual books that God wanted us to have? That's the question of canonicity. That's the way that we settle this, or that's the way we have this discussion. Okay, uh, let me set up the question a little bit more by talking through our notes for just a few minutes, and then actually we're going to finish in, in a, a little bit, because if you add up all the break times that we didn't take, we'll finish early today. So the problem of canonicity, oops, is the question, or the question of canonicity, how do I know which books God has given us? Holding nicely bound Bibles in our own language, it's really easy to assume it was always this way. Remember, though, that the Bible was written across 1,500 years. So Moses contributed, later David contributed. In other words, and, and across 1,500 years, you know there was lots of other writings. The Apocrypha would be the critical, obvious example of this. There's lots of other writings. I don't view the Apocrypha as evil. You could read the Apocrypha in order to learn. You can read the Apocrypha without it being evil. It's not an evil book, as long as you know it's not Bible, right? In other words, I'm reading a book right now, and uh, it's a book about Jesus and the gospel, okay? And I'm reading it, and I'm enjoying it, and it's helping me learn, okay? That's fine. There's no problem with reading other books, as long as you know it's not the Bible. And so reading the Apocrypha, it's not that it's evil. It's just if you think that's Bible, that's evil. That's all. You know. Okay. So at what point, the question we're asking, at what point was it confirmed that Malachi was part of God's word, but 2 Maccabees was not? How did the process work that we came to the conclusion, I would better rather say, that we recognize the fact that Malachi was scripture and that these other books were not? And can we be sure that those involved made the right decision? Can we be sure that the people who came to this conclusion were in fact correct? Maybe they made a mistake. Baha Khalanila, Song of Solomon is in, but it's not. Maybe they made a mistake. How do I know? That's the question we're asking. How do you really know? I, I, I don't, when I just said that, I'm not personally considering that as a possibility. I'm just saying someone could ask that question. So if they ask that question, how would you answer? No, I think Song of Solomon is part of scripture. How do you, how do you argue for that? Okay, um, here's a common framework for the argument that happens, and uh, it's not a bad framework. So I'll show you this set of kind of arguments or proofs. Uh, for the Old Testament, the Qumran community, that's a community of people, Jewish believers in the Old Testament. The Qumran community references every book except for Esther. The Dead Sea Scrolls point to a collection of all and only the 39 Old Testament books. The Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they're, they're different. I mean, there are lots of different scrolls. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are, are dating back to before the time of Christ. And within those, there is evidence that at least some people within that time believed in the 39 books that we have today. Nothing else added, nothing else taken away. Both of these date before the time of Christ. After the time of Christ, in AD 90, the Council of Jamnia answered charges against Esther, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Those are the four books in the Old Testament that come up a lot, especially Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. People have, have historically raised doubts about them. And writing around AD 90, Josephus gives us a list of the books that are justly believed to be divine. And he lists the very exact same books we have today, as well as Melito of Sardis in AD 7. Okay, so one way that we can argue for canonicity is we can go back and we can see very early people already had the same list of books that we have today. They already believed in the same 39 and no extras, nothing else added. In the New Testament, we have a similar thing we can do. Uh, Clement, who lived 30 to 100, he personally knew Paul. He refers to 1 Corinthians 1, 11 to 15, and he says it is written under inspiration of the Spirit. He also quotes 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and he says that it is Scripture. 
he also refers to seven other New Testament books. So if we look at Clement's writing, and he is right at the time of the New Testament, he's alive during the New Testament being written. He's looking at different books and he's saying, this is scripture. All right, think about how dramatic actually that statement is. Right, if you had a, I don't know, your pastor or a friend of yours or something, and so your friend writes a mission, let's say he's a missionary, your friend is a missionary. He writes a missionary prayer letter back to his home church. And you receive the missionary prayer letter and you read it and you say, this missionary prayer letter, this is the word of God. So you would never say that, right? So for Clement to be saying, when he picks up Paul's letters and he says, this is God's words, that's a very dramatic statement. That's amazing that he could say something so, so strongly, right? Really amazing uh, assertion. Polycarp, who was personally taught by John, references or quotes Matthew, Acts, 2 John, 1 Peter, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, and Titus. Okay, and here's the thing that is so amazing about that. Realize part of the marvel is not just that he quoted them, but that he had access to them. Because just remember, it's not like they can email them around. They can't save them in a Dropbox folder. They can't put them on Facebook. Okay, so how does Polycarp, who's personally taught by John, in other words, he's like second generation. Here's the apostles, Polycarp is second generation. And he already has access to all of those books. It's not just like he has access to Paul's books. He has access to Matthew, Acts, second John, first Peter. He has access to almost all of the authors representing almost every author of the New Testament, okay? And he references all of those. So that's amazing just that he had access to them. The only way you could get a copy of those books is if somebody hand copied the book. And that has to travel across space. So in other words, Paul writes it to Rome. It has to be copied in Rome and moved all the way back to wherever, I forget where Polycarp was, back to wherever Polycarp was and all of these different books from different places brought back to one place. That's amazing. It's telling you that very early on, the New Testament books are being spread. The Muratorian Canon, which is late 100s, acknowledges four gospels, all of the Pauline epistles, and omits, omits only Hebrews, James, oh, what happened here? James and first and second Peter. Uh, though even there, the document was damaged. And so we're not sure, actually, it may have included those as well. Okay? But the point is it included most of the New Testament books. Eusebius lists 22 as accepted by all. And by 367, Athanasius lists all of the 66 Old Testament books, listing the New Testament canon in 366 and even in multiple languages fixed by the late 300s. Okay? So here's the argument. The structure of the argument goes, um, it's not like the canon has been a battle for a thousand years. It's not like for the last thousand years, 1500 years, different groups have been saying, I think this is scripture. No, I think this is scripture. And everybody has their own view and we can't agree about what is scripture. Very, very early in the history of the New Testament, it was already settled. Old Testament and New Testament, very early. Right? So that should be one pieces, piece of that. The marvel in all of this is how the biblical documents spread so, so quickly. How did so many people who spoke different languages, who were separated by hundreds of miles, how could they all agree about the biblical documents? There was no central church office to tell them, here's the books you will use. Okay, And so it would be a little bit like this. Let's say I put a pile of 200 books on the table. And I tell you, 200 books on the table, 66 out of the 200 are actually God's word. Figure it out. I send each member of the class to a different room with that pile of 200 books. And I tell them, figure out which ones are the 66. And when it all gets done, we walk out the door. Maybe we don't have perfect agreement on every one, but like several of the people in the class have gotten these exact same 66. And the others might have a difference of one or two, 
But actually, a number of us came to exactly the same conclusion in different rooms with no help, just by ourselves. Okay? Something is really, you've got to explain something there, right? Something's going on here that's really incredible. And that's, as far as we understand the history, something like that is happening here. That they could come to any kind of agreement is a miracle. That's really true. That, you know, you put different groups together, they're going to come up with different conclusions. That they could come to any agreement is a miracle. And all of that is a testimony to the work of the Spirit in human hearts. But, and this is where I'll uh, plan to end out our time today. But my core argument for the canon is not resting on the history. So my core argument for the canon is not, well, look how early all of these things happen. That's not my core argument. My core argument for the canon would be, it's not that they decided the canon, it's that they recognized the canon. That's my core argument. My core argument is they recognized the canon. Meaning, the books were already scripture. They only recognized them. Okay? So I have here on my table up here three different bottles. I'll have to hold it up for the online class. To see. But anyway, you'll just have to trust me. There's one more. I have three different bottles up here. Okay? One of the bottles in here is uh, chai tea. It's really good. The other is black tea. And the other is water. Okay, those are the three different bottles. Now, it's not that, I, so I'm gonna, I, let's say I want to drink water, okay? Which one am I going to drink out of? Well, this one is the water, okay? So if I say this is the water, it's not that I'm deciding which one is the water, it is the water. It's not like this is sort of water-ish, it's just water, okay? And it's not really hard to figure out, I can look at it and tell this is tea. I can drink it and tell this is tea. I can drink this and right away know this is obviously water. It's obvious. Okay. So if I say here, okay, one of these is water. Which one is it? And somebody says this one. And they say that because they came up here and tasted it. They say this one. I say, okay. So you decided that this would be water. No, you didn't create water. You didn't decide that it was water. It was already water. You just tasted it. You looked at it and it was obvious this is water. It's not hard to figure out, okay? That's the concept with the canon. You have 200 books on the table. 66 of them are God's words. Which ones of them are God's words? Which ones of them are not? So then a group of people come over here and they read the books and they say, these 66 are the books that are God's word. And we say, oh, you decided which ones would be the Bible. You didn't decide which ones would be the Bible. They already were the Bible. You didn't decide you just read them and you figured out which ones were the Bible. The same way, this is obviously water. It's not hard to figure it out. Okay. So the critical foundation is to, you've got to, to know this concept solidly. Not that they decided what the Bible was. They recognized what the Bible was. They recognized what the Bible was. Okay. It was not a decision. They just recognized that. Now next week, I'll build out some of the ideas or some of the foundation why we are supporting that and how we argue for that. But critical to know, not that they decided what would be the Bible, but they recognized what was already the Bible. They just recognized it. Okay. Um, any questions from that? Okay. Once I do that, then I recognize all of this argument here this information that I gave you, Old Testament, New Testament, this is not the proof of canon. This is just the evidence of canon. Uh, in other words, the, the deeper concept of canon goes that God has given us his word, and we know that, we believe that, reasons I'll talk about next week. We believe that doctrinally or theologically. We don't depend on the history in order to prove that it's canon. Because they just recognized it. They didn't decide it. They just recognized that it was canon. It was already truly God's word. They only needed to realize that it was God's word. Okay, good question there. Uh, Mom Joyce, how do they recognize by the Holy Spirit? And my simple answer is yes. My more complex answer is uh, read page 118 and 19. 
So this section here, and actually I, I'll look at my syllabus in a little bit and see what you're assigned to read for this week. But this section one, two, three, these three points are the critical foundations for Canon. So if you'll read those three points, then you get a lot of information there that are giving you more of the how did they recognize or why did they recognize, what drew, drew them to these specific canons. I'll also show you an interesting website if you're interested in uh, checking out some of this more. There's a really interesting, it's michaelkruger.com and I'll grab the URL for that as well. Uh, give me a second. Um, okay, so he's a blogger and that means that it's not like the first thing that comes up is necessarily going to be the topic of canonicity. But Michael Kruger has written a bunch about canonicity. And if you're interested then in going further with it, this is kind of the place to start, to start learning about canon. So he has a lot of different just blog posts where he's going to talk about this. And I'll go further with this so you, you can enjoy, he's got good stuff in here. Um, but I, I'll go further with this. He's got two books that he's written on Canon that are pretty nerdy. So if you're really interested in getting into this deeper, Kruger is, that's, those are the books to read. They're really, really helpful books on uh, the Canon. In fact, I'll see if I can pull those. Let's see how quickly we can pull those up here. Um, so anyway, if, you ha if you're curious about that topic, I think that's, I would say that's the, uh, the place to start start working on this canon and uh okay look i mean you've got some different you've got some different interviews he's done i'm gonna guess if i do shopping here we go those are the two books the question of canon and canon revisited and i own those if you're interested let me know they're good books they're they're very helpful but they're a little nerdy okay that's my that's the extent of my plan for today so let me pull up your schedule uh, or if you have it, you can tell me. Just to remind us of what our reading is for this week. So if you can be, um, just make sure you're keeping up. I'm gonna pull up here, Dr. Nerve Revelation. And, um, well, I'm not seeing the schedule right away. Who has a copy of the schedule handy? Here we go. Okay, so for this week, I'm asking you to read chapters 13 and 14 and then answer the questions that are with it. It's reading chapters 13 and 14, answering the questions on that section. Um, you're going to benefit more from the lecture if you have read through the notes. So can I just encourage you, even if you are not credit, even if you're audit status, that's fine, it's great. To be audit status is great. But I would say you will still benefit more as a, uh, just a student of this topic if you'll read through the notes first because I'm assuming a lot of things from the notes, okay? So even if you don't plan to take the test, even if you don't plan to answer all the questions, read through the notes, because the notes will explain the concepts. And then as we talk through it in the class, I'll come at it from a different direction, not on two directions, okay? Um, and then one other comment I need to make here. So this is today, November 23rd. We do not meet next week. So don't come here next week. I mean, you can if you want, but nobody will be here. And if you tune in online, nothing will, happen, nothing will be happening. So we're not meeting next week, we're meeting two weeks from today, okay? And that's because here in the Philippines, we have a holiday next week. So next week is a holiday, two weeks from today we pick up. Uh, and actually that two weeks from today is when we're going to go more into depth with Canon and transmission. This will be a really interesting discussion just to understand the process of translation, manuscripts, how the, the Bible gets from Greek and Hebrew to a form you have holding in your hand. Okay, so that, that's a very important discussion. There's a lot of confusion out there about how this works with manuscripts, a lot of confusion. So we've got to talk through some of that so that I, I want you to be amazed at what God did for us and to really give him the glory for giving us his word, okay? So anyway, I hope you won't miss that. That's two weeks from now, December 7th and same time at that point. Okay, uh, last option here. Any questions, anyone, anything I want to fill out here as far as this topic before we keep on going or before we finish up? Okay, thank you to all. Uh, I'll leave the chat on for a little bit longer for the online people and I'll just watch it. If you have a question, drop it in there. We can chat a little bit here. 
And then uh, I'll be here as well to discuss with anyone else. So we will see you in two weeks. And that gives you, that's nice. It gives you two weeks to catch up on your homework. Have a little extra time. So if you're not uh, part of a sports fest or something next week, you can use that time instead of coming to class, just do your homework. That'll work. Okay. We'll see you in uh, two weeks. Thank you very much. See you later on.